A gut check for the data dependent. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Fu. We're kicking you off to the closing bell here in the U.S. Let's take a look at how Stark's stocks are faring today. You would think that given that this was a high-stakes jobs report, there would be a big reaction in the market to the better-than-expected economic data and this repricing of how much the Fed may cut interest rates next year. But you look at equities, not much of a reaction here. The S&P 500, yes, moving higher, up by a quarter of 1%, continuing that streak of not really moving or closing. Uh, by more than 1% for the past 16, 17 sessions. The NASDAQ 100 here, uh, we're looking, and of course, at the big cap tech names also holding up about three tenths of 1%. There is movement, of course, in the Treasury space. You see the 10 year yield move up. Uh, that is price down higher yields, eight basis points. There are 4.23%, some pretty big swings over the past week. And the VIX, pretty quiet here below 12 and a half at the moment remain yeah absolutely of course uh, the big focal point of all these moves that we're going to talk about today in u.s financial markets tied directly to that strengthening in the u.s labor force that report out this morning non-farm payrolls in november hitting 199,000 added jobs that's about 30 percent more than what economists had expected that includes 28,000 manufacturing jobs coming back online, 40,000 leisure and hospitality positions filled, and 93,000 health and social assistance hires. Even the government was onboarding. More people added about 49,000 positions in the month in wage growth. That's now holding at 4% compared to a year ago, putting a bit of a chill on the bullish narrative around bonds. Asterisk, of course, is that one report does not necessarily make a trend. But how about this for another report? University of Michigan, out with your latest consumer sentiment survey, how consumers feel about the economy. And that topped all forecasts as households dialed back those inflation expectations by the most in 22 years. While the cost of many goods and services do indeed remain elevated, you have key metrics like gasoline prices, which heavily influence inflation expectations, now at the cheapest that they've been all year long. In fact, AAA pump prices down 12 consecutive weeks, and in fact, they've fallen in all but five of the past 84 days. That will change sentiment. But of course, that brings us to the question of the day, Scarlett, and is will a stronger labor market and a more optimistic consumer actually change the thinking of the Fed? And more importantly, will it change the thinking of a bond market that has been pricing in a heck of a lot of rate cuts for next year? Those are the unanswerable questions, certainly. But, you know, for now, we won't know how the Fed communicates until next week, since policymakers are in a blackout period until next Wednesday afternoon when the central bank announces its rate decision and, of course, at the same time, releases new economic projections for the following year. As for pricing in rate cuts, there has been a slight shift here. Traders are scaling back their bets. They're now pricing in about 100 basis points of easing. That is four separate quarter point cuts for 2024. That's versus more than 120 basis points at this time last week. Now, when Jay Powell does speak Romain, it is unlikely he'll address the idea of a rate cut head-on for fear of uh, encouraging markets too much. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, how he threads the needle uh, next week. Uh, Tom Purcelli uh, joining us right now. Maybe he can help thread that needle. Chief U.S. Economist over at PGM helping us uh, kick you off to the close. And let's get right to it. I mean, we talk about, uh, you know, the, a report that, look, on the surface certainly was strong. And I know when you look under the hood, you can definitely find some weakness here. Does it fit, though, with the narrative that has kind of been unfolding over the last few uh, weeks and really months, that we are getting a more tempered labor market and one that is still, though, going to be resilient. Yeah. So, so first of all, good to be with you. Uh, and I, I think I think you frame it perfectly, Romain. I, I think you know you can sort of always slice up any of these data points however you'd like. So, so let, let's just try to be fair about this. I think my my, my general impression on today's report is I think it does just enough to really push back on the very near-term cuts that are being priced in. But I still think it's actually very consistent with the market looking for cuts in, in the coming year. I, I think that's a, the, 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 the right way of thinking about this report. So, so, so let's, just, let's just get into a bit mm -hmm. of the detail. Um, I, I think what you have to recognize is that there's been one sector in particular that is doing a disproportionate share of the driving, and that's healthcare, right? Healthcare added 93,000 jobs this month. It's been adding... Um, uh, a disproportionate share to the gain in jobs pretty much every month over the last six months. I mean, uh, you know, you can certainly go back to the beginning of the year and say we're still doing a pretty decent amount of driving. 
Mm -hmm. So so think about that, right? Like, let's say you just wanted to use headline. And I, I prefer private jobs, but fine, let's just use headline jobs. If you okay. printed 199,000 uh, headline jobs, you're stripping out 93,000 for healthcare. Um, that means that you're, you're gaining roughly 100,000 jobs. And by the way, again, that that's 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 headline. Right. Private is even less, right? So so let me just be clear on this point. Why strip out healthcare? Because I I care more about what's happening what's happening from a cyclical perspective as it relates to labor. And what's happening in the healthcare space is not cyclical. That's yeah. structural. Um, and so I think also that's the right framing of this. So again, I think yes, uh, near term cuts. We never believe yeah. in that. But we do believe in cuts. I mean, we think the first cut probably comes in Q2, and I think reports like this are very consistent with that. Well, well let's uh, keep on this uh, line here that you're going at, Tom, yeah. because I, I, I saw even our folks internally at Bloomberg Economics were kind of pointing yeah. this out as well. You strip out health care. You uh, adjust for all those auto workers coming back and I guess some of those Hollywood workers coming back, and all of a sudden 199,000 jobs is more, you know, in the, you know, uh, you know, five-figure range uh, instead of uh, the six-figure range here. Right. What is left, though? If you take out some of those one-offs here, then all of a sudden I'm looking at a report that seems to suggest that the labor market weakens substantially. It, 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 it has. I mean, again, I, I, you know, I, I keep on hearing, and I, in one of your lead-ins um, uh, earlier, it was like, you know, you know how you, 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 you fast-forward through, like, what everyone said about the payroll report? Everyone said the payroll report was strong, and I was just looking around. I'm like, well, I don't, I don't really know what they're seeing because I, I, that's not what I see. I mean, the, the, the payroll report is when you, again, when you fairly take it apart, I think it's really easy to make the case that there's been actually quite a bit of slowing. Again, I think enough slowing where if the trend in inflation persists, which we think it will, we think it'll usher in cuts. Now, again, I think the market has been a little bit aggressive, particularly recently with pricing and cuts. But I think cuts next year is an easy case to make. I mean, our view, as I said, is Q2. But I think, you know, starting in Q2, you could see three cuts over the course of 24. Hmm. Tom, did you see anything when it comes to average hourly earnings that has you concerned? On a month-over-month -month basis, we did get a hotter read 0.4% yep. versus the expected 0.3%. Yeah, for sure. And so I think, you know, some of that is um, a, a huge boost of that came from manufacturing. Manufacturing added like, you know, seven to eight tenths on the month. Um, so I think, if, you know, if you look at a, um, and there could have just been some mismatch uh, with um, uh, with certain sectors that were, that, that get paid a lot more. I think that helped boost um, the manufacturing space and as a result boosted the headline. If you just look at service sector, um, the service sector grew to three tenths. Uh, percent pace month on month. In other words, the the seven or eight tenths that we saw in manufacturing is not repeatable. Mm -hmm. So so that's that's this number. But if I think about what's happening going forward, I think the right way of thinking about that is you know just look at like the quits rate, right, which is down pretty meaningfully over the last several months. The quit rate tends to lead wage pressures, um, meaning um, you're looking at continued downward pressure. Um, from a uh, from a wage perspective, not the, and and you could also add on to that. Uh, and as um, you know, my my great boss uh, here at PGM loves to highlight. You know, if you just look at um, you know supply of labor versus demand of labor, mm -hmm. um, you now have supply um, that is uh, really outpacing demand, and that will be yet another uh, force that really pushes uh, wages down. Tom, I'm really intrigued by what you were saying earlier about looking at healthcare as a way of getting a glimpse into the bigger shifts, uh, cyclical shifts. Yeah. Is there any way to measure something like the impact of AI on an entire sector or um, the tech sector uh, to either push back or reinforce concerns that this technology will over time eliminate jobs? Yeah, I, look, I, I don't know if I would go so far as to say that it happens um, uh, immediately. I don't think it does. Uh, I think that's something that will take years to evolve. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, this is, it, it's not years, you know, in multi-decades from now, but I think, you know, within the next five or 10 years, I think you can actually see that. As for right now, you're, you're not really seeing any of that, but it's something to certainly keep your eye on. But again, so when I think about cyclical, I'm thinking right now, mm -hmm. um, and right now it's pretty clear that cyclical labor is slowing down. All right, Tom, always uh, great to talk to you and always uh, great insights here. Uh, Tom Priscilli there, Chief U.S. Economist over at PGM Fixed Income, helping us kick off to the close here with a big focus on the labor market and a conversation up ahead with the White House Council of Economic Advisors Chairman Jared Bernstein on his take on today's report. Plus, a new academic paper is questioning whether a 60-40 portfolio of stocks and bonds is really the best way to invest for retirement. We've got the surprising details ahead. 
And Starbucks shares have been under pressure for the last couple of weeks here. Now we're learning that they are looking to potentially resolve some of the union labor issues out there. We're going to take a look at some of the issues as to why investors have soured on this stock. That conversation and so much more coming up here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. Island emerging is a flashpoint between the U.S. and China. Taiwan's presidential election is drawing global attention. Taiwan is an elephant in the room. After the Biden Xi Jinping summit, we had some pretty tough talk. Racing for potential war scenario. As voters head to the polls in January, Bloomberg takes a close look at the candidates, the issues at stake, and what it means for the world. Watch the world premiere of Taiwan Decides, a special report tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Context Changes Everything. We're seeing Treasury yields surge on the back of solid readings on both jobs and consumer sentiment. The data sent traders paring back their expectations the Federal Reserve will ease policy aggressively next year. Our next guest says the latest data doesn't really change his view. Invesco's Brian Levitt writing, quote, the Fed is still likely to be on hold. We expect rate cuts later in 2024 as the economy slows. Brian joins us now to discuss. Uh, Brian, we're seeing the market pricing on rate cuts come back a little bit, but there is still pricing for rate cuts. Of course, this is just the lead up to the FOMC decision on Wednesday. We have CPI on Tuesday. What does the jobs report and the consumer confidence report signal about how investors are going to be positioned for that CPI report? I actually found the jobs report to be uh soft landing ish. I mean, it, they, you saw some concern that, you know, with rates going up a little bit and it was it was a slightly hotter than expected report. But the reality is that, um, you know, we don't want strong jobs reports when we're in an environment where inflation is elevated. But if inflation's back around low three or high twos, then it's OK to have a, a reasonably sound jobs report. So I was comforted with it, um, whether or not uh, the Fed um, lowers rates multiple times next year or so is um, at the end of the tightening cycle. Uh, the end of the tightening cycle is what's really been uh, in driving these markets, peak rates, peak tightening. Yeah. I mean, can we say definitively that the end of the tightening cycle is here or does this report still leave that open to some interpretation? Well, you may hear the Fed be a little bit more hawkish in their statements. They don't want financial conditions to ease too much, but I'm comfortable saying that the end of the tightening cycle is here. We, we've we seen inflation come down significantly, and we still need to see what the lagged effects of shelter will do to that number. So uh, my expectation is that the CPI will have a two-handle uh, very soon. And, you know, for the Fed, what the Fed is looking at is they, they have a funds rate that's north of 5 percent, and yet the nominal growth of this country is likely to be in the fours next year. And so they don't they they don't need to be that tight anymore if inflation's come down as much as it has. And inflation expectations are very well contained. Does this give you then a little bit more confidence in the 2024 about uh, asset prices and the continuation of some of the rallies that we've seen? Yeah, in fact, um, it's a market right now that's enthused about a, a soft landing. If you remember March through the spring and the summer, it was a very narrow market and rates had been moving higher, concerned that the Fed was going to have to raise more. This is a this is a different environment. Rates have come down. We just had the November was the best bond month in, in, in decades. And the market's broadening out and the market broadens out. It's it's saying that, look, this is an economy that that's going to hang in there and inflation's down. Now, at some point, you slow in 2024. And as you slow, well, that means that a five and a quarter, five and a half funds rate is just too high. And, and so the Fed will start to back off of that. Um, but, but yeah, that's a, that's a good backdrop for, for risk assets. I mean, my, my comments this whole time has been peak inflation, peak rates, peak tightening creates a good backdrop for, for stocks and for credit. And I'm, I'm sticking to that. Is there any sense, I mean, just kind of looking ahead at potential risk that investors should have their eye on, do you worry at all about some of the other things going on in Washington, meaning you go outside the Echoes building where they are sort of insulated from the normal uh, political drama out there. We've got a January 20th deadline to get some sort of new budget agreement done, which last time I checked is just a month away. Yeah, I mean, look, the, what, what's going on in Washington will uh, 
unfortunately be with us and is always with us and the markets tend to get past it my 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 thought on that is you know back to churchill's line which is americans always do the right thing but only after exhausting all other options so there could be some challenges in the short term around whether or not we can get a spending bill keep the government open but remember uh, we could have said the same thing coming into this year with debt ceilings and concerns about government shutdowns so Ultimately, um, I would expect us to get beyond those periods without significant incident, and, and that surely has been what history has taught us. Yeah, the problem is exhausting other options uh, can, can be very messy and can take a lot longer than we anticipate. How, how much are clients asking you about the presidential election and how you're thinking <laughs> about it? I, I know that your take on this is that people care about elections, but the market largely shrugs it off. But surely there are a lot of questions for you on this front. A lot of people are asking questions, and, and some of the things that I like to come back to is to say, look, the markets have done very well across most administrations, whether it's Democrat and Republican. Um, if you look at the first 785 days after Trump was elected, the market returns are very similar to the first 785 days after Biden was elected. And, of course, people were very worried in 16 and 2020 as well. And didn't matter uh, much at all. I, I've always come back to starting points matter most for the presidents. Uh, the way I explain that is I like to use the terms of Reagan and Obama. They both had eight years. They both experienced greater than 200% returns in markets. How could that be? They didn't have a lot in common politically, so it couldn't have been the politics of it. It was their starting points. They both became presidents coming out of recessions when stocks were reasonably cheap and the Fed was solving a major problem in the economy. To me, that matters far more, the starting point, hmm. rather than uh, the specific policies of, a, of an administration. Yeah, and uh, policies of an administration that always uh, have a very much lagged effect. So a lot of times the people who get credit, whether it's to the upside or the downside, <laughs> usually aren't the people who really deserve it. <laughs> Brian, great to talk to you. Brian Levitt, global market strategist over at Invesco. A closer look here uh, at that labor market report and the market conditions around it. Coming up, we're going to talk about a new academic paper that's actually questioning the wisdom of a 60-40 portfolio. That's stocks and bonds. They're saying, well, could a 100% stock portfolio actually be better? We're going to tell you what those researchers had to say. That's coming up next here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. There's a new academic paper shaking up the conventional wisdom on Wall Street. It says workers would have more money in retirement if they invested in an all-stock portfolio. Of course, that runs counter to the advice of many financial advisors, generations of advisors, really, who recommend a 60-40 portfolio of stocks and bonds or the use of age-based retirement funds. So joining us now is Bloomberg's Denitza Tsekova. Denitza, talk a little bit more about this study and what they found. Yeah, it's a really fascinating study, and it kind of breaks down all the... Uh, peers of investing pretty much. So if you think about uh, putting all your stocks, half of them in international stock, the other half in US stocks, you end up with approximately 1 million uh, by the age of retirement, according to this study. If you split it in the traditional way of, say, a 60-40 portfolio, you're going to end up with 760,000. So that's a quarter million less uh, if you go for the traditional way of investing uh, uh, b between stocks and bonds. Obviously, this is a very extreme take of just saying you have to go in the stocks and yeah. it's like, um, and. Uh well, but is it that extreme? I mean, you look at this here. I mean, we're talking about this is, I guess, based on the study alone, uh, the differential in returns. I mean, those are sizable gains. I mean, you're talking about a 20 percent differential uh, between the balance fund and that and a little bit less, I guess, if you do target dates. But what I also thought was interesting was they showed the drawdowns in those periods. And while the drawdown for stocks was higher, it was only marginally higher, something like, what, three percentage points versus a target date fund. So if you adjust on a risk adjusted returns, I would think that return differential is even greater. Of course, the math makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's, it's a really big, really big gain. The risk is obviously bigger if you go for in, in stocks. But as you said, compared to that, it's not that big. But this has been kind of a long uh, debate. And obviously, like, you don't go into bonds just for the sake of getting uh, that crazy return. You go into bonds because you have that safety. Mm -hmm. You don't have yeah. that volatility. Uh, so you can imagine for someone who had to retire in, 2000, in the 2000 or 2001, uh, you know, it, it's going to be a very difficult situation to say to that person, oh, it's going to be better off if you're 
actually um, yeah. uh, if you are fully in stocks and then can you just wait out uh, yeah. for stocks mm -hmm. to recover like that can be a very painful thing and obviously like the, the way you think about retirement, you have to have some, uh, um, you know, some peace of mind. Yeah. And also, like, Cliff Asnes has a very uh, famous response to the first time there was such sturdy. And um, his point was, like, obviously 60-40 cannot give you those crazy returns, uh, but going fully into stocks is pretty extreme. If you go somewhere in the middle, if you have a more leveraged version of the 60-40 mm -hmm. or you diversify the 40 part, then you have a more balanced approach where you get the better returns uh, and maybe don't go all into stocks. Well, having said all of that, you look at the 60-40 portfolio performance so far this year, and it's working. I know 2022 was a totally different story, but it is working overall, and bonds you know, can be a hedge. Yeah, of course. I think that's a big part why this study is coming um, today. We had two years of negative performance for bonds. People were wondering, can bonds hedge? Can bonds have positive returns? The correlation has been fluctuating so much, obviously, with inflation being such a concern. Uh, but yeah, what we're seeing the last month is a very strong performance by the 60-40. Um, and for example, there are other strategy like risk quality and um, other quant versions that are a little bit more volatile. They're performing worse than 60 60, 40. So, um, you know, it, it, I, I think investors yeah. tend to change performance, chase performance. Yeah. So you can miss a big gain if you go all in now, maybe. Yeah, interesting uh, study. Uh, Denitza, great uh, conversation. Denitza uh, Sakova, one of our cross asset reporters here at Bloomberg. And we should point out, too, I mean, and, and you know, when you're talking about retirement planning, this isn't a zero sum game. It's not yeah. about the person with the most money at the end wins. Obviously, everyone has different needs. And you always hear this from financial advisors, right? If you've got the person who's retired who has you know maybe no kids or no grandkids mm. that they need to take care of versus someone who has multiple kids and grandkids that they have to plan for or elder care and yeah. other things you know so there's a lot of different considerations. there's a reason why some people might want to go to 60 40 something maybe doesn't return as much but offers maybe a, a, a better modicum of safety yeah although i think a lot of people would disagree with that idea that the person who dies with the most money wins i think yeah. there are people who definitely subscribe to that yeah uh <laughs> okay i did certainly so here uh then i guess they maybe they should take that thing but it gets gets to the idea too about conventional wisdom and yes. that when we talk about 60 40 and some of the other more traditional investing metrics we have to remember these are things that were created in some cases a century ago yeah some of these ideas and you know times change and times change some, and the way you point, can access yeah. the market has changed as well yes. for the younger generation they don't have to call up a broker and do any of it they can do it on their phone and they have been doing it on their phone and in many cases they don't trust the public markets like equities like bonds they'd rather go into crypto or nft yeah. to, to you know at their own risk of course but yeah. that's been happening yeah absolutely all right uh stick around a lot more coming up here on the close we're going to check in on commodities in just a second we'll be back in a moment this is bloomberg This is the countdown to the close, just about 2.30 here in New York. A bit of a flip-flop going on right now in the Treasury and equity markets and a bit of a flip-flop as well in certain parts of the commodity space. Let's get right to Abigail Doolittle, who's standing by right now with our commodity close. Abigail. Well, indeed, Romaine and Scarlett, we do have some mixed action here for some of these uh, commodities, and a lot of it has to do with that jobs report, investors uh, redoing their Fed bets, for lack of a better way to put it. But in any case, for New York crude, we do have a bit of a rebound rally, a relief rally, back above $70 per barrel. Still in that technical breakdown, probably goes to 65 uh, but often you'll find, again, a little bit of relief where the sellers lay off. Copper up 1%, despite the fact that the Bloomberg dollar index is also higher gold on the other hand and this probably has a lot to do with that jobs report a little bit hotter than expected the idea that the fed may now not cut quite as much or quite as quickly gold is down 1.4 percent and then wheat despite some uh, positive information about the idea that the u.s may ex be exporting more uh down 1.6 percent now if we take a look at what's happening uh, over the last several weeks well oil's in a world of pain romaine take a look at this bear market uh down 20.3 percent and you can even look back a little bit further and uh, or I guess yesterday before today's gain it was a, a deeper uh, decline not something a lot of people are talking about uh, sometimes this could be a negative sign ahead uh, for stocks all right our thanks there to Abigail do a little a look at what's going on in the commodity space let's turn back to equities and one of the biggest movers of the day Paramount Global up 14 percent second best day for this company 
in the past couple of years. This on the back of a report here by Deadline that says David Ellison and Redbird Capital have expressed interest in buying the company. Felix Gillette joining us right now here at Bloomberg News. And uh, I guess it's not a complete surprise that somebody might be kicking the tires on the multitude of streaming companies that exist out there. Uh, how much do we know about the, any progress on talks on this deal? We know those talks are very preliminary. Mm. So this is not going to be an imminent sale. But I think if you look down what's going to happen in the next year or two, everyone thinks there's going to be more consolidation in the streaming service space. Mm -hmm. Um, nobody likes to have to subscribe to five or six different uh, streaming services just to find the show or movie you want to watch. Yeah. Um, and I think five when you look six, at the that, landscape, that's cute. That's yeah. more, it's more like 15 to 20. Yeah, and days. if you look at the landscape, yeah. you think, well, who's going to be the first to sell, you know, or combine with yeah. someone else? And Paramount is really the one that everybody points. to. Do you to. remember this this Super Bowl commercial when they aired this out, and then of course nobody actually subscribed? Because no one knew what it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, that's, that's all. There is all their greatest hits. You got. Uh, Captain Luke Picard and who was that? Uh, DJ Khaled, yeah. some Butthead. Beavis you didn't say they make you sign up, Archer. <laughs> yeah, they have I, a I can go. IP. I can go on. They do have, have a lot of IP. The problem is all those channels <laughs> that people used to watch: MTV, VH1, Tom Selleck, Nickelodeon. Yeah. All those young audiences yeah. have migrated elsewhere. Yeah. So yeah, well, those young are, audiences are now Gen right. Xers. That yeah, are. the young audience was us, and you can see we're not <laughs> exactly, exactly spring yeah. chickens anymore. So here's my question: We know that there needs to be some consolidation in this space. There are too many streamers. How does Redbird Capital consolidate the industry? Because it just changes ownership. It, it doesn't actually get absorbed by a bigger player. Yeah, well, I think the problem with absorbing a bigger player is that there's regulatory issues with the other natural fits, which would be like Comcast or Warner Brothers Discovery, but they both have broadcast networks, uh, as does Paramount uh, with CBS. You know, if Skybird came in, Skybird has already done... Um, or Skydance has done, you know, they have franchises already with Paramount, like yeah. Mission Impossible. So there's um, a partnership there. Yeah, I think they want the studio. They could get control uh, through the parent company, National Amusements, without having to buy the whole thing, which would be what, way more expensive. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I would think that there would be more sell-off sell of assets. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm curious about, because, I mean, this is a pretty capital-intensive business. And, yeah. of course, we know a lot of these private capital firms are kind of not necessarily capital intensive, at least in terms of the strategies they take. They obviously yeah. look to cut a lot of fat. And I just wonder how they're going to find, if this deal does go through, how, you, how they're going to sort of find that balance between, I guess, appealing to what is the typical private equity, private capital playbook, and yeah. really the need yeah. to fund new programs. Yeah. Well, I mean, the one obvious idea that people have talked about is like, you know, shut down Paramount Plus streaming service altogether and just combine it with the Skydance uh, oh, yeah, studio yeah. and then become a seller like Sony is. And then you could sell your programs to yeah. Netflix. You, do you, you remember they used to do that, though, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and everyone they just, used to Then that. they decided not to do that and right. they lost a bunch of money. And, you know, Paramount yeah. Plus and, yeah. you know, is Pluto are just losing a huge amounts of money at this point. Um, and so, yeah, that's one play. What do you do with those uh, cable assets? What do you do with CBS? You know, I mean, there's big. They, they're going to need to keep spending money right now. What's the best thing in CBS? Well, they have NFL games, yep. which are the biggest thing in television. But you're essentially renting that. At some point, you're going to have to renew with the NFL. That's going to cost a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. And I think people just look at the. Uh, ownership, and they think Sherry Redstone, her family, their fortune has already declined. Maybe it's time, you know, to And sell. she's not her dad. Maybe she doesn't want to be running this thing and calling the shots constantly. Maybe she wants to peace out. Yeah. I mean, it seems totally natural that this will happen at some point. All right. If not right away. Felix Gillette, thank you so much. And Felix, what book did you write again? It, it's not television? It's not TV. Yes. Yeah. It's about HBO. So yeah. he follows this industry closely. Thank you so much. All right, another big story that is out in streaming today, Bloomberg learning that the sports platform DAZN, and that's spelled D-A-Z-N, is exploring ways to raise fresh funding of as much as a billion dollars as it looks to accelerate its global expansion. And of course, everyone needs money if you're going to be bidding for live sports rights. That's always what it comes down DAZN, to. You know, yeah, I had, I had some really good uh, DAZN uh, yogurt this morning. It was uh, black, <laughs> black cherry. Yeah, different Really DAZN. good. Um, I, so can I just say one thing? As someone, I don't watch a ton of uh, sports, and I have to say, that this is actually new to me. Like, I, I didn't even know this existed. And it gets, to the, it gets to the whole idea that there are so many streaming services. Yep. And it is so fractured, right? Mm -hmm. Because if somebody recommends, oh, you should watch this thing, and then you go look it up and realize, well, I'm not subscribed to it. Yeah, I can't I, And find I don't want to add to the other 18 subscriptions I already have. Yeah. Then you just pass on it. You just pass on it. And especially if they go after 
more niche sports. I'm not saying boxing is niche, but it's more niche than, say, football or basketball, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So um, there is definitely a built-in audience, and that audience will seek it out. But at the same time, um, they need to kind of keep building up something to get that recurring revenue stream. I, I think one thing, I mean, talking about this story and then talking with Felix a second ago here, is that there is going to be consolidation in mm -hmm. this space. But more importantly, it's very clear that this sort of golden era, what would they call the golden era of TV, TV, where we had, that that is long, yes. well behind us. Yeah. And who and no one seems to know what the new version of TV is going to look like other than it's going to contain a lot of live sports. And it costs a lot of money. Yeah, a lot of live money. Lot Every lot month you look at your credit card bill and you're saying, wait, there's also $13 for this? I didn't even realize I signed up for it. I know. All right, still ahead, we're going to recap what's been a pretty busy week for fast food chains like Starbucks, McDonald's, and Domino's Pizza. Starbucks actually broke its losing streak before resuming its losing streak once again. We've got more on that next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Restoration Hardware, now called RH. Jeffrey's lowering its price target to $269 from $345. The analysts citing disappointing quarterly results last night, as well as the guidance and a slower than expected recovery in luxury and housing. And then you combine that with what the analyst says is a much more promotional home furnishings market. You put it all together, you get a 13% drop in the shares. Decker's Outdoor, up next. The parent company of Ugg and Hoka shoe brands, downgraded to neutral from buy over its city. The analyst cautioning that his call isn't a sign to head for the exit, but he does believe market expectations are just a bit too high and, quite frankly, too difficult to beat now that the risk-reward has balanced itself out. A relatively balanced stay unchanged on Decker's. And finally, First Solar, the clean energy company raised to overweight from equal weight over at Morgan Stanley. The analyst saying First Solar has one of the strongest risk-adjusted earnings profiles out there particularly when it comes to their clean tech coverage. And after that recent sell-off, the analysts also say the shares have a good risk-reward entry point right now. The shares higher by a half a percent on the day, and those are some of our top calls. We do want to say in the sell-side space and take a closer look at a stock that has been has had interesting moves over the last couple of months. Starbucks seeing some gains today. But this, of course, you have that big 8% rally in November. And, well, what happened since? A big downdraft here with the stock dropping in 13 of the last 15 sessions. The, some analysts say that there are softer consumer trends out there, at least when you take a look at some of the higher frequency data. And its CEO is now pointing the blame at sales in China. Let's get the view from Nick Setjam. He's Wedbush's Managing Director of Equity Research covering restaurants. He has a neutral on Starbucks shares. All right, let's start off with that sell-off, which was kind of a stealth sell-off. There really wasn't a lot of discussion about it, and there seemed to be some anecdotal evidence here that foot traffic in the stores wasn't necessarily holding up in the third quarter. Was that more of a U.S., North America thing, or was this more about China? Well, the uh, high frequency data, I think, is is more just about the domestic business, so the U.S. business. And, you know, there's historically a very high correlation, especially in this quarter, the current holiday quarter, with foot traffic in, 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 in retail corridors and, and Starbucks. And so as people are staying home more and ordering online more, they're not going out and, and buying Starbucks. And so that's part of it. Uh, you know, across uh, the entire space, we've seen the lower household income uh, you know, demographic uh, start to slow down a bit, uh, including trading out of, uh, uh, you know, restaurants to, to grocery, which is seeing, uh, you know, in, in very low single digit inflation, maybe even deflation. So the part of it is that as well. So mm -hmm. uh, you have a weakening consumer and you have, uh, uh, you know, some, some, some trends, some structural trends yeah. that are working in Starbucks in the near term. Well, Starbucks has been relatively silent on this, but I go back to that earnings report that we had at the start of November, where they basically reiterated their guidance for uh, the full year 2024, basically saying that those growth targets, as well as their longer term growth targets, which I know were kind of in the double digits, kind of 15 to 20 percent range, that they thought that they could still hit that. Has anything changed materially to make you think that they're not going to be able to meet that target? I, mean, I don't think it, I don't I don't think the the actual EPS expectation is uh, is at risk. I mean, they just have given their scale and and the cutbacks they can do on on costs and GNA, et cetera. I think, you know, the EPS targets are safe. Uh, I also think it's going to be a little bit more of a back end loaded uh, comp for the year. Uh, you know, the compares are much tougher and in, in the first and second quarter for them, mm -hmm. uh, their fiscal quarters. Uh, the current one is their first fiscal quarter. 
and it becomes a little bit easier in the back half. And so, um, yeah, and, 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 and we do have to, you know, uh, talk about the fact that it's a very lofty expectation, right? I mean, seven to eight percent in the current quarter, you know, maybe we, we see a six percent comp instead of an eight percent comp. But at the end of the day, that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty attractive comp for a company of this size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm curious, Nick, when it comes to things like that 12 day losing streak, uh, the negative momentum, which you know we were watching and I'm sure upper management was aware of, how concerned, how sensitive are they to that kind of losing streak? Do they reach out to analysts like you or other sell side analysts to, to kind of make their case, to, to push back a little bit and say, hey, here's what's going on, or do they just let it go? Historically, Starbucks has let those types of things go, and then they'll respond, you know, uh, accordingly with with that in the in the hindsight mirror. But uh, you know, this time around, they were pretty silent. I do think that, uh, you know, if anything, management team came out to the CEO and said, "Yeah, I mean, maybe it, this this year is going to be a little bit more, you know, back end loaded," almost confirming the, uh, you know, the data that we're seeing in terms of the credit card data on a daily basis. But again, I mean, this is in the context of some very very high expectations. And so even though, you know, relative to those high expectations, we've seen a little bit of softness, mm -hmm. uh, it's still within the realm of, of, of reality, you know, uh, in the context of their overall annual guide. So uh, maybe going forward, it can give us a little bit more, uh, you know, granular guidance for, uh, with respect to the forward quarter. Uh, but essentially, I think uh, they're going to talk about annual guidance being right. more or less impact. So the other headline when it comes to Starbucks is that they have reached out to the union representing hundreds of stores, its stores, to try to end this impasse over contract talks. I know that this is still early stages, but how are you thinking about how to incorporate that into your forecasts, if at all? Well, they, they gave pretty aggressive guidance around around labor, uh, uh, you know, expense and, and, and the investments they're making next year. You know, that's I'm sure that was part of the expectation. Uh, and so, you know, I don't think that changes uh, my model, my estimates dramatically, if at all, um, just because they already gave us a, a pretty aggressive uptick uh, in labor costs, uh, you know, in, in the forward year. All right, uh, Nick, uh, great to catch up with you. Nick set you on there over at Wedbush, a closer look at Starbucks. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and of course, Scarlett, we have been talking about that big down draft mm -hmm. in the shares. At one point, it was on that 12 day losing streak. Yeah. And down 13 of uh, the last 15 sessions. Uh, that's not a good sign. No, from $107 to $95. I, I think it's interesting that, you know, the company stays quiet and then after the fact will not reference yeah. it, but, you know, say what they need to say. I, I'm yeah. always curious to what extent they're sensitive to those things. All right, stick with us. We're going to take a deeper dive into those labor market numbers, the health of the economy. White House Council of Economic Advisors Jared Bernstein is up next. This is Bloomberg. I think what we're seeing is, again, we look at overall trends in the economy. We've seen uh, job growth at record rates, certainly faster than anybody predicted coming out of the pandemic. But it wasn't just like, you know, one time boost in the immediate post pandemic months. It's been um, year over year growth. And that was acting U.S. Labor Secretary Julie Su speaking earlier about the strong November jobs report. We want to get some more insight out of Washington. And for that, I am happy to welcome Jared Bernstein. He is chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Jared, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, the labor market really has held up remarkably well, even after a series of very aggressive interest rate increases from the Federal Reserve. We saw jobs grow in November, in large part because a pair of strikes were resolved. But the growth was faster than expected. So to what do you chalk up the larger than expected increase to? Well, I wouldn't say that the strikes were determinative uh, uh, by any measure, maybe 30 or 40,000 jobs. But of course, that was a negative in October and a positive in November. So the underlying growth, which is the best way to look at this, is about 200,000 jobs per month. So that's the average over the past three months. By the way, I noticed an interesting pattern today. If you look at um, average monthly job growth uh, um, by, uh, by year, in 21, it was 600,000 per month, climbing out of that deep trough, 400,000 in 22. And in 23, it's been, as I said, around 200K. Now, this is very much a strong and sustainable pace of payroll growth, fast enough 
probably even fast, uh, more than fast enough to keep the unemployment rate low. And in fact, the unemployment rate fell to 3.7 percent in November. It's been below 4 percent for uh, 22 months uh, in a row. That's a, a 50 year record. That is a labor market with real ro real momentum, putting some tailwind behind consumer spending, especially with easing inflation and rising real pay. So good momentum in these numbers. Are you adjusting your 2024 forecasts in any way, whether it comes to job growth or wage increases? Well, this is a pattern that we've pretty much expected. Um, in other words, you never uh, you didn't hear the White House talking about, you know, 100 percent probability of recession as some outlets were uh, a year ago. Um, we've been emphasizing that uh, if we kept uh, a steady pace and did all we could to maintain the strong labor market, to get supply chains unsnarled, and to aggressively reduce costs where we could, that we'd settle into more steady, stable growth. So this is pretty much in line with what we've uh, what we forecasted. Uh, do you, when you look at this report and, and you put that with all the other uh, labor market reports we've had uh, over this cycle here? Does it feel to you and to the president, for that matter, that the gains that we're seeing and the strength that we're seeing is broader base that's evenly distributed across uh, the workforce? Uh, it, it does in a, in a particularly important way for this president, and that's, that's talking about the impact of persistently tight labor markets on the pay of middle and lower wage workers. You know, if you look at average uh, wages the way we, we always do this time of the, uh, of the month, they were up 4% year over year. That's nominal. It's about the same as, as October. And at least in October, that cleanly beat inflation. We, we hope it does so again in November. We don't have November's inflation yet. But if you then drill down and look at some of the workers in lower paid industries, you'll find that their pay is actually growing faster than average. That means wage compression. It means a little bit less wage inequality. It means a, a better real boost for workers in the bottom half. And that's very consistent with uh, Bidenomics and the idea that empowering workers disproportionately help those who've long been left behind. Oh, what's next here, uh, Jared? I know that the president has had tried to, uh, his, oh, well, not tried, but he has had a few initiatives, including the IRA and, and a few other measures that have actually managed to make it uh, into uh, uh, the light of day, uh, despite uh, Congress's best effort. But I am curious as to what more he can do. He's got another year left in office, at least in this term. Uh, and he's facing a Congress in an election year that's probably not going to be very cooperative with any other economic measures coming out of that building behind you. Yeah, well, so uh, it, with this president, the grass does not grow under his feet. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's not just a matter of what he will do, what he is doing. So take today, for example, where he is traveling to Las Vegas to talk about high-speed rail. Now, I worked for Joe Biden when he was the vice president, and he got high-speed rail into the Recovery Act, which you may recall back from 2009. So he's been working at this for a long time, and he's just been relentless. So he's very excited to be out there today talking about an eight-plus billion dollar investment in high-speed rail, at least on the West Coast uh, projects. You're talking about 35,000 jobs in constructing this rail. 10,000 of them will be union jobs and, uh, you know, public transportation, environmentally friendly, and a much better deal for uh, travelers who want to get from one place to another quickly. And that's very indicative of what's coming, the idea of implementing the legislation that we've had thus far and, frankly, drawing a contrast to those who are trying to repeal it. You know, we're talking about inflation. This president yeah. wants to reduce costs, reduce junk fees, reduce the price of prescription drugs, reduce the price of, of uh, electric batteries, reduce the price of insulin. Congress, Republicans in Congress, want to reverse all of that, and that looks to us to push exactly the wrong way on inflation. All right, Jared, always appreciate you taking time for us uh, on these uh, days of economic data. As, of course, everyone in the market really hangs on every data point. Jared Bernstein, chair of the White Thank House you. Council of Economic Advisors. Now, some breaking news crossing the wire on the Bloomberg terminal. This involving Apple and the head of its iPhone and watch design, Tang Tan, uh, we're told, is set to depart the company based on uh, reporting by Bloomberg, uh, who spoke with several people uh, who said that he plans to leave in February. His official title is vice president of product design. And, and 
an interesting departure, particularly given there's been at least two other design execs uh, that have, have been said to have mm -hmm. also planned departures. Bloomberg reported a little bit earlier uh, that Steve Telling, and he was the vice president of hardware technologies, is going to leave. So that was like the face ID kind of stuff. And then another uh, report uh, said that the senior vice president of hardware technology also There's been out. quite a bit of movement here yeah. at Apple, which is in contrast to what it was like under Joni Ive when he was head of design. And I think back to how he be kind of became a household name because he was so closely tied to Apple design. And now you've got a lot of competent people, a lot of expert people, but it's not quite the same, is it? Yeah, it would be interesting, too, uh, to see a kind of uh, how they're reshuffling the deck and whether they bring anything new to the table. Tang Tan, the vice president of product design over at Apple, stepping down. This is Bloomberg. And welcome back. We do want to get back to that breaking news that we told you about a few minutes ago. This involving Apple and the executive in charge of product design for the iPhone as well as the watch. Bloomberg has learned that that person does plan to step down in February, bringing a shakeup to the company's most critical product lines. Mark Gurman joining us right now uh, with the scoop here. Uh, tell me, Mark, Tang Tan, I'm not familiar with him, but it sounds like he had a very important job. Yeah, Ting Tan, he's a bit under the radar. You didn't see him in Apple's marketing videos. You won't see him on Apple's website. But behind the scenes, he's a critical person as part of Apple's hardware engineering process. He's been a long time top deputy to John Turnus, to Dan Riccio. That's the current Apple hardware engineering chief and the preceding hardware engineering chief. Obviously, Apple is a hardware company. It's a product company. So that division is perhaps its most critical. Right? And this person, Tang Tan, he's in charge of product design, or PD, as they call it at Apple, for the iPhone, for the Apple Watch, for many accessories. He was in charge of things like acoustics, which is behind the HomePod and the AirPods. Uh, so he has been instrumental at Apple. He was a key design lead on the iPhone and Apple Watch since both those first products first came out uh, many years ago. So this is quite a bit uh, of a shakeup for the company. And you reported that there have been some other departures from Apple as well. Uh, Steve Hotelling, a VP in charge of hardware technologies like Touch ID, he's retiring. There's also uh, Yannick Bertolis, who was once in charge of hardware product quality, uh, recently retired. Is there a talent issue over at Apple that we should be aware of? I don't know if there's so much of a talent issue, but I think we're in the middle of a bit of a changing of the guard in some respect that some... Uh, parts of the company. I mean, the Vision Pro, that's their big new product category they've been working on for seven years. That's essentially done and will be shipping soon. Uh, the stock is at all-time highs. We, we wrote this week that they're back above the $3 trillion market cap threshold. Uh, RSUs, stock valuations are very high. People are making a lot of money. And people may be tired and wanting to move on to the next thing. So you're seeing a mix of departures in the case of Tang Tan. And you're seeing retirements, as in the case of Steve Hotelling that we wrote about earlier this week. One thing I'll note, the Steve Hotelling departure, that's within the hardware technologies organization. That are underlying components, underlying technologies, touch ID, face ID, multi-touch, whereas product design is how the product looks, the features it has, the development of the device, really the nitty gritty, the core, yeah. the core of product development at Apple. So. Uh, this is a big departure, but there are lots of deputies to both Turnus and Tan yeah. stepping up. Uh, yeah. They've put the Apple Watch design under the Mac person, so there's a lot of yeah. movers and shakers right now. All right, Mark Gurman uh, with the scoop. Tang Tan, vice president of product design over at Apple, said to be stepping down uh, in February here. We should point out Apple shares higher on the day. In fact, uh, right now on a six-day uh, run, uh, or six-week run, I should mm -hmm. say, uh, of gains uh, for Apple here. As we get closer to the closing bells in a broader market that's trying to find uh, some fresh life as well. Yeah, in fact, if you look at uh, how the indexes have performed since about 12-15, it's been pretty much a steady uh, buildup with indexes now all in the green. Uh, uh, the Russell 2000 actually leading the way up two-thirds of one percent. Dow Transport's uh, still lagging here, but stocks trying to claw back, shrugging off some of the doom and gloom around that labor market report. Our cross-platform coverage starts right now. Countdown to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. 
We're joined right now by our colleagues, Mike Regan and John Tucker, in today for Tim Stenovic and Carol Masser. A hearty welcome in full to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms on this Friday afternoon television radio originals and our partnership with YouTube. Fractional gains on the day for most of the major indices, uh, Mike Regan. Uh, fractional gains on the week as well. Fractional gains remain, but really interesting level in the S&P 500. We're actually setting a new uh, uh, year-to-date high in the S&P 500, which to me, it doesn't quite smell right given this pickup in yields that we're seeing, Scarlett. So I don't know. I don't know if this is a bit of a head fake that we're seeing today. It may very well be. And we, of course, have a big CPI report come Tuesday that could change things around completely before the FOMC decision on Wednesday remain. Yeah, and I am curious. Uh, if you get your thoughts, uh, guys, on the labor market report that we got this morning. I mean, certainly the headline number was a lot of strength, unexpected strength at that. But then, of course, when you look at the folks over at Bloomberg Economics who look under the hood and they say, well, look, man, you back out the striking workers who came back into work. You back out health care. You back out government uh, gains in government employment. And, well, you have a labor market that's actually contracting. And, you know, i got to focus on the yields right now. The two-year, 12 basis points higher. The 10-year, 8 basis points higher. That's at four and a quarter right now. And I pose the question, is this a buying opportunity? I missed yeah. out on 5%. I'm sorry. Tans, can we just stop here? Does... Does John have a different microphone than us? Because he sounds better. He sound, yeah, you sound <laughs> that nice, deep, rich, authoritative voice. I think he just voice. sounds better, period. Meanwhile, the rest of us are just like squawking chickens oh, you're, here. Oh, you're just jealous. I am. I'm, <laughs> uh, yes. It's like Barry White over there. <laughs> <laughs> you see why they keep John uh, around here, uh, the soothing voice of Bloomberg Radio there. Uh, I mean, but what is the setup then into that meeting next week? I mean, I know the Fed always says, look, it's not just one report, one data point they're looking at. It's got to be the amalgamation of it all. But is that amalgamation going to actually lead to five rate cuts like the market is pricing in? The amalgamation will lead to let's sit here and let's watch and let's see how things proceed. Uh, we're, we're not in a rush to do anything mm -hmm. and we're content to be patient. Yeah, and I would say, uh, Romaine, not exactly breaking news, but it wouldn't be the first time where short-term interest rate traders got it wrong with their bets on the Fed. I think there could be a little bit of wishful thinking priced in with these uh, this notion of aggressive rate cuts next year from the Fed. But mm -hmm. uh, we got less than a week. We'll yeah. find out from the Ooh. Fed themselves with those dot that dot plot where exactly they're expecting oh. rates to go. So dot plot, um, okay. could 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 be some uh, yeah. turbulence next week, Romaine. Yeah, it could be, and maybe this uh, scar is a kind of that, that structural shift in, in everything that we've been talking about. I was taking a look at another story, which also shows a structural shift, Scarlett Fu. Remember all these, like, perks uh, that we got, like, during the pandemic, or at least, you know, to kind of keep workers happy and yes, keep them from that's the key. coming and coming out? I'm told that those are ending. Yeah, indeed. Uh, the online job search company has now pulled back canceled the mental health days that it gave to its employees uh, in the middle of the pandemic. And a lot of that was because people were feeling burnt out, but they weren't taking time off. So instead, the company said, OK, every day or once a month, you know, yeah. everyone can have a mental day, a mental health day. Wait, I'm well, confused. that's the not happening anymore. The math isn't adding up here. So <laughs> they were burnt out, so they gave them days off for their mental health. But now they're saying they're not burnt out anymore, so let's take away those days. They're what's, just what, saying what's, they're, what's, they're, what's on the other side of that equal people song? are able to take vacations once again. People can take time off, so you don't need the mental health day. That well, is the argument. That's we the all weekend. need a that's mental what the weekends are for, right? <laughs> Especially right now. You're going to make a great manager someday, Scarlett. <laughs> you know, Mike I'm, and I'm I, just giving you the explanation. I don't believe this necessarily. <laughs> Mike and I don't get a graphics budget because we're in radio, so I took the liberty of drawing it myself. As I pose the question to you guys, is it going to be a soft landing? Uh, is it a Goldilocks scenario? There's my graphic for Goldilocks. That's, did you do that yourself? <laughs> Is it going to be a soft landing? Wait, is this? Did you freehand this? Wow! Of course. For, for our but radio let me audience, present you with yet a third us. scenario. A third scenario. Goldilocks okay. in the cockpit at okay. the controls. She's holding up a plane. for a soft landing. With Goldilocks that looks like Taylor Swift. Plane. Is that Taylor Swift driving that plane? No, I think that's actually no. That's you. Well, it could be. It's supposed to be. You Goldie. can't John afford Taylor Swift driving that, John Tucker was piloting so that airplane. <laughs> I don't think any of us could. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, I'm not sure Goldilocks would be up front, though, right? Isn't she a little too young to be piloting in a plane? And there are I mean, three she, bears I mean, in she is a passenger. Child. She's ageless, Goldilocks. <laughs> three bears. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That does it for now. I think we're going to check back in a little bit later with uh, Mike, uh, John Tucker. With and more drawings. Team here, uh, live on TV and radio and YouTube at 4 p.m. for our Beyond the Bell coverage, where we take you through today's market close. And just a reminder, the Bloomberg Business Week is now on Bloomberg Originals. 
And we continue our coverage right here on Bloomberg Television, counting you down to the close with just about 50 minutes until we get there on the day and on the week. And our next guest sees a shift in investor stock preferences. Melissa Brown over at Axioma writing, we see better performance in smaller names, higher beta, higher volatility, and less profitable companies. This represents a shift from last month and is one of the drivers of our improved assessment of investor sentiment. Please to say that the person who wrote that is sitting right next to us now. Melissa Brown, you can speak for yourself over at Axioma. Great to have you here. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, well, I'll just throw it to you. Explain. Well, um, we have seen a definite shift in the kinds of stocks that investors are buying. And um, they are buying those kinds of stocks that suggest they're more risk tolerant. They're less concerned about, um, you know, preserving their, their mm -hmm. assets. And, and um, so it does show that investors are and have been over probably the last few weeks mm -hmm. getting more positive. When you uh, take notice of, I guess, folks taking more notice of other stocks, is it indiscriminate, meaning is it just kind of like, okay, we're all back on risk on, or is this much more be very selective, pick what you want based on whatever fundamental profile you're looking for? Well, to some extent, it has still been this kind of magnificent seven kind mm. of market, which I'd say mm. is, you know, being fairly selective. Mm. But it does seem to have broadened out from that, at least over the last week or two, mm -hmm. where they, um, I don't think it's indiscriminate. I think their investors are still careful, mm -hmm. but they are looking beyond just those few names. Gotcha. And is this new money being put to work or is this people taking taking down some of their positions that had worked and then applying it to new places? Um, I, you know, I think it's probably a little bit of both. With longer rates coming down, you get a little bit of a shift back out of the bond market yeah. into equity markets. So that's some new money um, or newish money. Um, and um, but I think also it's, you know, just um, a rotation from some of the less, um, you know, the less uh, gl glitzy and glamorous. Right. Things. And the U.S. has been kind of the glitziest, the most glamorous market when you look at what's been happening globally. One thing you note is that investors are increasingly getting more uh, curious about the U.K. and China, which really surprised me. What are you hearing from people? I mean, we are seeing that those markets um, also are showing, um, you know, China, the, the returns haven't been so great in China. Yeah. Um, but we are seeing that sentiment, that same sentiment improvement there as well, where you, again, are seeing, you know, investors moving more to risk on, um, out of risk off. I have to ask you uh, about just economic conditions overall, because the picture being painted right now is one of a soft landing or softish at least here. And at least for right now, the data seems to support that. Do you think it's still, that data is still going to signal that level of balance as we get deeper into 2024? I think so far the data is showing that a soft landing or, you know, possibly um, no landing mm -hmm. um, if things continue to be, um, you know, strong. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that that is um, that's good news. It does mean that um, we might be um, back in this higher for longer rate environment mm -hmm. if the Fed's not worried about a recession. Mm -hmm. But that actually is probably good news. This also gets to this whole idea of I guess who's driving this market right now? I think for a while it was very clear the Fed had the wheel and everybody else was just kind of following. Now it kind of appears that the market, certainly in the Treasury market, they've really gotten out in front of this. And, and even in equity investors now seem to be kind of way ahead of where Powell, I think, probably wants them to be. Well, you know, it was interesting because if, if you look at the CME Fed Watch, mm -hmm. um, the, the expectation was for rates cu rate cuts when Powell was saying, no, we have yeah. no rate cuts yeah, on yeah. the table. So, the, yeah, there definitely has been kind of a separation between, you know, what Fed says and what investors do. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, pro you know, I think maybe they're converging now mm -hmm. um, as, you know, we see, you know, continued um, decent employment and, you um, and other decent economic conditions. All right, Melissa, uh, always uh, great to talk to you. Uh, Melissa Brown, Managing Director of Applied Research over at uh, Axioma. We do want to bring you some breaking news before we move on. This involving Smile Direct Club and efforts by the founders of that company to help pull it out of bankruptcy. We're now learning that that rescue deal has failed and that the company now is likely 
to liquidate. This is according to a combination of uh, reporters, of people that our reporters have spoken to, as well as uh, court, uh, court filings uh, that show that Jordan Katzman and Alex Finkel's efforts uh, to take back this company, at least for right now, appears to be failing, and the company is likely to liquidate. Scarlett? They're back to the drawing board, I suppose, yeah. for any possibility of uh, getting some fresh capital. All right, coming up, we've got much more to go with the close. We're going to get some more insight on the jobs market from Neela Richardson. She is chief economist at ADP, which, of course, had its own numbers earlier this week. Uh, plus, we're going to talk about an international ring of thieves. Amazon says they swiped the millions of dollars in merchandise from the company. We're going to talk about exactly how that scam was carried out. And DraftKings is hit with a class action lawsuit alleging that advertising for the sportbook's $1,000 bonus bet offer is, quote, unfair and deceptive. I think everyone has seen that ad, right? All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. With the island emerging as a flashpoint between the U.S. and China, Taiwan's presidential election is drawing global attention. Taiwan is an elephant in the room. After the Biden-Xi Jinping summit, we had some pretty tough talk. Racing for potential war scenario. As voters head to the polls in January, Bloomberg takes a close look at the candidates, the issues at stake, and what it means for the world. Watch the world premiere of Taiwan Decides, a special report tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Just about 43 minutes until we get to the closing bells and a broader racket market right now trying to extend what at least for the S&P has been a five-week winning streak here. They are getting some help from some of the Magnificent Seven, including some pretty sizable gains out of meta platforms, as well as other names in the energy space and in the industrial space as well. Put it all together here, we're only up about four-tenths of a percent on the S&P 500. Most of the other indices also holding on to similar fractional gains. But on a weekly basis here, that could be good enough to keep all of the major indices here in the U.S. US up on a weekly basis for yet another five-day stretch here. Where's the help coming from? Well, it's not really coming from the Fed anymore. It's not even necessarily coming from rates, given just how volatile it's been in the Treasury space, and it's certainly not coming from the commodity market. So what? A lot of it really is just about a shift in sentiment. We heard that from Melissa Brown. We've heard that from some of our other guests that we've had on the program this week. Inventors, investor sentiment has certainly improved dramatically, to the point not necessarily the cash is coming off the sidelines, but that it's willing to rotate out of that magnificent seven and into something a bit broader. Let's bring Abigail Doolittle into the conversation as we do every day at this time. And Abigail, we always know that the market isn't really about absolute numbers or absolute values. It's about relative value and it's about correlation. And you've been taking a look at some of those correlations, particularly when it comes to oil, natural gas, the dollar, and yields. Uh, we have, Romaine. And speaking of a shift in sentiment, I think that a shift in sentiment coming off of that slightly hot jobs report has uh, shown itself in all of those commodities uh, along with the dollar and yields. Let's bring in Carly Garner founder of DeCarly Trading. Thanks so much for joining us for Options Insight today. And Carly, it's funny, when those numbers first came across, I really didn't think it was as hot as uh, the bond market did, but we have the two-year yield, the last time I looked, still uh, backing up about 12 basis points or so. The dollar's up a little bit. Oil getting a bit, and it's interesting. It seems as though maybe traders think that uh, with that payrolls report, the economy, it's not all doom and gloom. What are you seeing here? Tie it together as Romain was talking about those correlations. And are they working the way we think that they should be? Well, it, I, I, the jobs report to me uh, signals some sort of Goldilocks economy, which is a perfect case scenario for most asset prices drifting higher. Um, the, it, the interesting thing about treasuries is we went from like a month and a half ago, a, a market that nobody wanted to touch to suddenly putting together one of the biggest treasury rallies on, on tape. Um, the, you're, you mentioned there's a big sentiment change, and there is. Investors suddenly are looking at treasuries as a, in positive light as opposed to negative light. But the interesting thing is, if you look underneath everything, the COT report, which is the Commitment of Traders report, it's issued by the CFTC, and it tells us where traders are, are holding position and how big those positions are. In late October, Treasury futures, uh, the 10-year note specifically, were seeing the largest net short position in the history of 10-year note futures. So everybody was short, and it seems like in the cash market, everyone was under allocated. And so now we're getting a little bit of a, a reversal of that, but the numbers suggest that we're just starting out. Like we're still holding one of the largest net short positions in the history of treasury futures. So we've unwound a little, but not enough 
to uh, to say it's over. In fact, it, this is probably just the beginning. Yeah, and with that two-year yield holding its 200-day moving average, uh, I wouldn't be surprised personally if we saw that net short stay longer. But to your point, it has to undergo at some point. So tie this into the dollar and then oil. So uh, st stability in treasuries, uh, specifically lower yields, writes a lot of wrongs. And in my opinion, it's going to put some pressure on the U.S. dollar. This is a little different than uh, traditional correlations. The two black back-to-back -back black swan events that we had have, have kind of wreaked havoc on correlations, but I think they're starting to normalize. If interest rates go lower and the dollar just lower, as I expect it to, that should give uh, everything else the, the green light to normalize. And if that's the case, the lower dollar will eventually provide some support for crude oil. Oil. Uh, crude oil seasonally bottoms out right around this week or next week, so we're getting really close. And we're also up against some significant trend line support around $68, $67 a barrel. So I'm starting to turn friendly in crude oil. Natural gas, well, it's been a pretty rough year, Carly. <laughs> Down, I think, more than 50 yeah. percent. What's going on there, and how do you recommend trading that? To say the least, I mean, this is a boomer bust market. It always has been, but we're, I think we're at the bust end of things. And uh, crude oil and natural gas have become very highly correlated, which tells me natural, if one of them bottoms, they, they're both going to bottom. And given the fact that natural gas is trading uh, at mid twos, I think it's probably the first place I'll start to, to look for upside. So um, we have an option spread that takes advantage of that. Uh, that also has some room for error. It's a bull call spread with a short put. You buy the March two fifty call, sell a three dollar call, and then sell a two dollar put to pay for it. It's a free trade, but there is a margin requirement of five grand because there's unlimited risk under two. Which, if we go under two in netcast, that'll be shocking, but it's not impossible. Uh, and the trade has about eighty days on it, and it could make as much as five thousand if you held all the way to expiration. And gas was above three dollars. Great perspective, a nice call uh, on your bullish call on bonds that you've had for some time. I'm going to be curious to see whether it continues or if it eases off a little bit more as it is today. Uh, but in either case, very nice call there. Carly Garner, founder of DeCarly Trading, thank you for joining us for Options Insight today. And from New York, this is Bloomberg. All right, listen to this. DraftKings is getting hit with a class action lawsuit for its promotion offer. The Public Health Advocacy Institute is suing DraftKings, the sports betting company, accusing it of misleading new customers into believing they would actually receive a $1,000 bonus once they deposit money into their account. Uh, the fine print is always the key here, Romain, and yeah. the fine print indicates you need to deposit $5,000 and then bet $25,000 within 90 days, and then you get that $1,000 bonus, and you can't use that bonus, uh, you can't refer transfer that bonus, and you can't redeem that bonus for cash. Okay, can I, uh, I think this is interesting. Can I take DraftKings' side don't, sure. for a second? Because did they disclose this? Or? It's in the fine print. Because that, I, I know. It's, a it's always in question. the fine print. And, and, I, and look, I get it. No one reads the fine print. Half the time, I have to click on one of those, you know, You click on, I agree, I agree, I agree. You yeah. agree. But I, I don't know. I, I feel like these are pretty clear-cut numbers. And I, I remember seeing these promotions, and you always kind of think, there's got to be a catch, right? There, there does have to be a yeah. catch. The, the complaint indicates that the target customers are new to sports betting and therefore extremely unlikely to understand the gambling lingo in the fine print. Okay, I, I could believe that. So, yeah, yeah maybe if you hide behind ha fancy words that people aren't familiar with, that yeah. might be an issue. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether, whether this, uh, uh, this case, this lawsuit, I should say, uh, has any real traction. It's kind of on behalf of this, well, like a couple of gamblers who, uh, yeah. who felt hoodwinked by yes. it. But, but it gets to a broader question, not just with DraftKings, but other companies that use these types of promotional offers that really have so many strings and conditions attached to them, you'll never actually exactly. uh, redeem them. By the way, DraftKings did not respond to a request for comment. So, yeah. you know, we're now, when you signed up for DraftKings, did you did you get a thousand dollar offer as well? I'm not on DraftKings. What okay, are you, about? you don't gamble. No. Oh, okay, good. I just talk a lot of smack about it. <laughs> That's wrong. All right. No consequences to that. All right, stick with us. Uh, more uh, Scarlet Food talking smack after the bell. <laughs> this is uh, the close on Bloomberg.
This is the countdown to the close. Just about 30 minutes left to go here in the trading day and in the week, Scarlett. And it looks like we have a modest rally in our hands. We do. We have a modest rally underway. It started off with good economic news, uh, being bad news for stocks and bonds. But by midday, that good economic news turned into good news for stocks as well. You have 11 industry groups in the S&P 500, and seven of them are higher, led by energy as oil prices rebound back above $70 a barrel. Technology also doing well gaining nine-tenths of one percent. And those two sectors together combined with a consumer discretionary really account for the lion's share of that pie. On the downside, we've got consumer staples, real estate, and utilities losing ground, each by less than half of one percent remain. Yeah, given the uh, labor market report this morning, Scarlett, as well as some of the other data we're going to get next week in that Fed meeting, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the economy and what we can sort of read about the economy from some of the price action in the ind individual stocks. Take a look at booking holdings, up only a percent here on the day, but at that price level that's a record high in fact a lot of the uh, travel stocks are doing incredibly well the cruise line stocks having a phenomenal week so a lot of people are still spending on a lot of those discretionary services like travel similar story in the housing market dr horton 138.63 that's going to be a record high if it closes at that level. In fact, most of its peers are also trading at record highs here uh, on this Friday afternoon. Meanwhile, Johnson Outdoors, they prim primarily make most of their money from like fishing and other water sports gears, camping gears, think that stuff, having one of their worst days in quite some time. This after the company said that that was 30 plus percent growth rates on revenue that you saw during the pandemic. Those days are over, saying that a lot of the demand, that was a pull forward during the pandemic. And now this is going to take a while for things to sort of moderate and get back to a baseline that that is more amenable. And Newmont Mining and the rest of the gold miners also moving lower, and that's because the price of gold is lower, Scarlet, primarily because of the shift in now rate cut bets on the back of what appeared to be a bit of a shift in the strength of the labor market. All right, well, let's talk about the strength of that labor market. Once again, it did show that jobs, uh, job growth rose more than expected in the month of November. And of course, we had a series of guests weigh in on the data and more importantly, its implications for central bank policy. Take a listen. This is a good report. It exceeded expectations. It's a bit stronger than expected. It's stronger than expected on many levels. It certainly doesn't make the Fed want to cut interest rates at this juncture. The Fed is really unlikely to start cutting in March. This is a report the Fed is going to look at and not really feel compelled that they need to embrace these early rate cuts next year that the market has priced in. The market has to think very carefully about the amounts of cuts it is pricing in for next year. Markets were a little overzealous. They were pricing in a March more than a 65% chance of a March cut. That that seems uh, seems overdone. Probably on the margin, it supports a pivot that starts in the back half of next year. It's more likely to come in the second half of the year. I think the Fed uh, is months away, if, you know, if not quarters away from cutting rates, and this report certainly is not going to make them want to do that anytime soon. Now, of course, earlier this week, ADP came out with its own data on the jobs market, showing that there was an increase of 130,000 jobs, also more than what was expected. Joining us now is Neela Richardson, chief economist over at ADP. Neela, so the ADP employment report for November and this uh, Labor Department report, uh, both indicating better than expected growth in jobs. What does this mean in terms of any kind of forecast for recession? Uh, that it's premature. I think what you're seeing with an unemployment rate at 3.7 percent, that the labor market has been the Fed's strongest cheerleader in this market. It's allowed the Fed to do exactly what it wanted to do without creating a dent of job loss in the economy. And you can see with this latest report, I, I do think it's slowing. I do think there is some pockets of weakness, so I want to put that out there. But overall, it's a solid hiring trend, and the Fed is well positioned to do whatever it wants to this month based on other data. Uh, they don't have to look through the lens of the labor market uh, in order to make this decision. Interesting. They don't have to look through the lens of the labor market to make that decision. So when you look at the jobs report and what it indicates about wages, because inflation is top of mind for the central bank, what does the bigger than expected monthly gain in wages indicate to you, the 0.4 percent increase versus the expected 0.3 percent? Look, I'm going to talk about the data I know. Um, ADP pays one in five workers in the United States. Our businesses pay, our businesses payroll. And when I look at the data on hourly workers, it has not budged from $17 an hour for 10 months. Hmm. Year on year, it's flat, 0%. When it comes to payroll and wages, this ship, this plane has landed. And so looking at wage pressures, they're 
virtually non-existent in this labor market. Yes, we are seeing uh, year over year, it's a little bit higher than it was before the pandemic. But in terms of new hires, people who were hired in the last three months, those hourly workers that pushed up wages last year, uh, we're not seeing those gains. So again, the Fed has a little latitude here. If they want to hike rates this uh month, they can do so without fear that they're going to see a big spike up in un unemployment rates coming shortly after. Does, but do they need to? I mean, given everything that you just said, it sounds like at least the path is kind of uh, maybe pushing us closer to that 2% target, maybe a little quicker than thought. I think it depends on how patient you are on the last mile back to the 2% target. Um, maybe the Fed has the ability to hold rates at the level they are, and the economy naturally resumes that comfortable target. But I don't think what it means is that you're going to see a, a, a rate cut mm -hmm. in the next six months, because we haven't reached the 2% target yet. And it doesn't mean that as soon as we hit the 2% target that the Fed is automatically going to start cutting. I think they want to see that number stay stable for, yeah. for a period of time before they change their, t their tune again. Well, that gets to the whole issue here of where do we find that balance in the labor market. We know the pendulum uh, has really swung in the favor of workers over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and obviously in the years prior to that, it was really it was in the favor of the employers. Do you think that the ending point of all this will be something that's a little bit more equitable for everyone. And when I say that, I mean something that will actually last longer than just, say, one business cycle. I think we've seen a whole host of changes in the labor market, and the pool of options have only amplified. Uh, if you talk, like, broad in the discussion past just this month's job games, you've seen a lot of things that are, are shifting in the labor market. One of them is hybrid and remote work. That is now a negotiation point that wasn't there three years ago. And that negotiation point might be a trade-off between flexibility mm -hmm. and how much a person gets paid. I think that's a really important nuance to when when you look at the future of work going into next year. But hiring uh, by itself has been pretty solid. What we see, though, is a weakness in one of the stalwarts of the labor market, which is leisure and hospitality. You didn't see it in the government data today. But if you look at ADP data, we've seen a consistent slowdown over three straight months in that sector. And that, to me, means that the job gains that we see next year are going to be much more modest than the market has gotten used to. Yeah, that's a good point, especially with that uh, headline that Stellantis may cut 3,500 U.S. jobs uh, in, uh, let me see, in Toledo, Ohio, as possibly as early as February, uh, according to Bloomberg reporting. Neela, thank you so much. Chief Economist over at AGP giving us uh, her view on the latest jobs report. Coming up, we've got the top three. This is our new segment where we focus on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's time now for the top three. Every day at this time, we take a deep dive into the people at the center of the day's top stories. Romain, yeah. you're going to kick us off. What are you looking at? Uh, I'm, I'm taking a look at uh, Levi Strauss. Uh, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the genes yes. here. Uh, Chip Berg, uh, the CEO of Levi, uh, going to be stepping down uh, from the company. Now, this was somewhat kind of known. They had already kind of named a successor a he's while retired, ago. right? Michael, uh, uh, Michelle Gass. Yeah, and he's 66 years old. And, of course, he's probably most credited with actually bringing this company back to the public markets. He's been CEO since 2011. Remember, Levi? I came back to the public market in, uh, I believe it was 2019. Uh, but there have been a lot there. of questions, too, because, uh, you know, sales growth has kind of slowed over the last few quarters, and uh, maybe now is the time to kind of shake things up. He did do a lot. I mean, remember, when he took over, Levi was still just kind of a men's brand, mm -hmm. and he was really the one to say, look, we need to kind of appeal to women, create some new styles that will keep them kind of in the fold here. Uh, but anyway, uh, he is stepping down at age 66. Uh, Michelle, he's going to stay on as executive chairman, but uh, Michelle Gass Play is Play an advisory up. role, yeah. you know, yeah. as, as they usually do. I was just checking in. Since uh, under his tenure as CEO, the stock has returned uh, total annualized returns of 14%. So not bad from that perspective. Yeah. All right, I am taking yeah, a look. Particularly compared to some of his competitors. Exactly, yeah. in the retail space for yeah. sure. I'm watching Mackenzie Scott. She has donated $2.15 billion to charity over the past year with gifts going to nonprofits ranging from 
the Asian American Journalists Association, so yay, to an abortion pill provider. And, you know, the numbers in terms of what she's donated since her yeah. 2019 divorce from Jeff Bezos, yeah. pretty remarkable. $16.5 billion given out to more than 1,900 nonprofits. So when I saw this story uh, today on the Bloomberg Terminal, Mackenzie Scott donates $2 billion to 360 uh, different charities. That was the headline. I thought, she still has $2 billion left? Because I feel like every uh, every few months we hear a story about her giving away billions of dollars to a multitude of charities here. So. First of all, bravo to her. Yes. I mean, obviously, some of this money is, is needed for a lot of these causes. Uh, but um, what's the end game here? The end game is to distribute yeah. it to charities that don't normally get a lot of attention. Yeah. And so, yeah, bravo to her. Yeah. She's worth $33.7 billion. So there's a lot more of those $2 billion gifts to come. Okay. Well, good for her. I wish to point out, too, I mean, there was some criticism uh, when she first went down this road that she wasn't necessarily vetting uh, all the charities, or at least her people weren't vetting them to the extent. And there were a couple of charities that... Um, Turned out to be maybe a little controversial, right? In terms or maybe dodgy, of, uh, getting the, or dodgy, right? That so maybe uh, hopefully that's been addressed as well. But you know, the numbers, uh, you know, I mean, 1,900 yeah. nonprofits. There's going to be something that doesn't work out there, right? Yeah, it's a lot. It's a, it's definitely sort of a fishnet kind of approach here. Yeah. Um, Who else I, want, are you watching? I wonder if I don't know if you've heard of uh, John Rom, but um, according to uh, various sources, he could uh, potentially be uh, one of the higher paid golfers out there mm -hmm. in the world, making the switch from the PGA Tour over to Live Golf. Of course, that's a, a Saudi back league that uh, raised a lot of uh, hackles over this uh, early this year and last year. Uh, but it raises the question here, too. Uh, we don't know how much he's getting paid, but I I'm curious as to what they're offering to lure these, these folks away from PGA Tour, specifically over to live. I think that's negotiable. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, be, the fact that we don't know the exact numbers and we don't know how yeah. this, it's everything structured means that they can raise their concerns and talk about what they want. A lot of the golfers' issues with the PGA is that it's kind of handed down to them. Everything's set in stone, and they don't have a lot of room to negotiate. So this is a case where they can kind of be more entrepreneurial in terms of dictating yeah. some terms. But, I mean, yeah, and the dictating some terms. And we should point out, I mean, he is, for all intents and purposes, probably – the best golfer, yeah. at least yes. in the moment, right now here. I think they say he's technically he's ranked number three. So my forg forgiveness, I don't know who one Who's and two one is, and but, two. Uh, I, uh, but forgive me. But he's a big deal. He just won the Masters, so this is a huge coup, at least uh, in terms of uh, the, the sort of the, the the veneer, the optics of it. It does raise a question, also, what's going to happen with that PGA Golf Tour and Live Golf yeah. Tour merger? We I don't was have confused. an update on like, that. Like I know they're trying to block it, and then I mean, so, they're supposed so to update. So if he goes to Live Golf and then they buy each other and he's just back on the PGA Tour, how it's does that work? It's not clear. It's not clear. Yeah. There's a lot of question marks here. They have to give an update to the U.S. DOJ before December 31st. So yeah. of course we'll be all over that yeah. but uh, how much you know, money we don't know. Uh, how much money do you think he's going to give away to charity he's going to give away to charity <laughs> uh, whatever right, his accountant recommends to the closing <laughs> bell emily Rowland, co-chief investment strategist over at john hancock investment going to be joining us in just a second 15 minutes till those closing bells this is bloomberg We want to uh, go back to some breaking news involving the war between Israel and Hamas. We're learning that the United Nations uh, had held a vote, the Security Council, at the United Nations, on a resolution seeking a ceasefire in Gaza. We have now learned that the U.S. vetoed that measure. So once again, the U.N. Security Council resolution seeking a Gaza a ceasefire has been vetoed by the U.S. We should point out that Deputy Ambassador, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Robert Wood, did tell the Security Council that they did not support a call for a ceasefire, saying they would only plant the seeds for the next war. Those are his words. Most of the Arab states had been advocating for a ceasefire, but once again, the U.S. said that right now that would not lead to any material progress in their eyes. So that resolution now a veto. Scarlett. All right, let's shift gears to the market because we've got 10 minutes before the closing bell. And right now you are looking at a gain. I hesitate to call it a rally, but maybe we should call it a rally given that uh, it took a while to find the footing for the market. And we have advances in both the S&P, Dow, Nasdaq, and the Russell 2000. Uh, you're seeing also Treasury yields move higher. So that advance is limited to equities. Bonds still selling off at the moment. Uh, the yield on the 10-year moving up to 4.7% right now. All right, uh, let's uh, get right to it here as we count you down to the closing bells. Just about eight minutes to go. Emily Rowland joining us right now, co-chief investment strategist over at John Hancock Investment uh, Management. Emily, uh, 
we were talking a lot uh, with some of my colleagues earlier today about, remember, I don't know if you remember, it was like a year ago, everyone was talking about the vibe session, the idea that the economy was still relatively strong, but the way that consumers and people were behaving seemed to signal some degree of a recession. It almost seems like we're getting a somewhat different playbook now, where while we are seeing some softness in economic data, we're also still seeing a significant shift upward in consumer and household sentiment. Yeah, what's happening right now, Romaine, is we're experiencing a pivot party in the markets. Markets are very much focused right now on the fact that there is disinflation in the pipeline. Really, the party started uh, when we first got that October CPI reading in the middle of last month. It, it came in lower by 0.1%. And all of a sudden, you saw yields plunging, you saw the dollar weakening, and you saw this big, big risk on rally. And, and frankly, that's continued uh, into December. Maybe Santa came a little bit early, but we're still seeing signs of that. You know, and, and you look at riskier areas of the market, like Bitcoin reaching year-to-date highs. You've got high-yield bond spread sub four percent. You've got the VIX at the lowest levels of the year. So I think inflation is the number one thing that's really been driving sentiment and consumers mm -hmm. are feeling it too. You yeah. saw the University of Michigan sentiment survey indicate that inflation expectations have plunged one year from now. So lots of good news. Everything seems to be pretty awesome as far as markets are concerned. Does that, and, and, and you know, and I have to sort of throw that back in your face here, everything looks awesome, <laughs> but is that going to sort of end up coming back to bite us? Because it does always seem we get to these extremes where the market piles into sort of one area on, in terms of their expectations for economic and market conditions, and then it sort of tilts it so far to one end that you almost get a snapback at some point. Yeah, look, I mean, it's great that disinflation's in the pipeline and that the economic data is holding in. The jobs report this morning certainly provided further evidence that the U.S. labor market's the bright spot of the economy. The challenge is that a lot of it's anticipated in the price. So the best thing we had coming uh, had going for us starting this year was that valuations on the S&P 500 were pretty modest at about 16 times forward earnings. Sentiment was really bearish. We essentially have the opposite net right now. We have 19 times forward earnings on the S&P 500, and analysts are penciling in 11% earnings growth for 2024 on top of that. So there's a lot of optimism that's already baked into mm. the market right now. We want to be careful um, of just really kind of thinking that we can beat that bar that's already really elevated. Yeah, things are getting a little heady, it feels like. And, you know, I think about your comment about this being a late cycle environment. Um, what are the other markers of a late cycle environment? I mean, you often see a pickup in M&A, and Abby has made two big M&A announcements uh, this week alone. So to what extent are companies driving this on their own? Yeah, there's definitely, you know, an element here where, where things still look pretty decent from a from a profitability standpoint. You know, inflation is still elevated. That's actually been a good fundamental driver for stocks. But what we see going forward is that companies are going to need to start contending with the higher cost of capital. The Federal Reserve just went from the, the loosest monetary policy in decades to the tightest over the course of 18 months. And we know that Fed policy works with legs. So what we expect to happen is that as the cost of capital for companies goes up and record revenue growth, which was helped by elevated inflation, comes down, then companies are going to start to deal with margin pressure. And as they contend with that, they may need to lay off their workers. That's typically what happens. And it's a key reason that we're honing in on higher quality companies, ones with great balance sheets, with low interest burdens, with better profitability yeah. uh, as we head into this, this environment where quality is likely to get rewarded. We also think bonds are going to play a much bigger role in portfolios, especially given the income that's available to investors from here. So when it comes to this late cycle environment, I, I know that you're going to say don't try to time it because that would be futile. But how are you thinking about <laughs> <laughs> suggesting to people who are intent on not missing out any more of this because they might have missed out on some of it already um, before making that switch to uh, that more defensive posturing? Yeah, and these late cycle environments are these pivot parties that we talked about. You, you want to go to the party. You just don't want to stay that late. <laughs> um, I, I know that's frankly never a problem for me personally, but 
Uh, if you stay too late at the party and the Fed does ultimately start cutting rates, that's actually not good for risk assets historically. It means that something's likely wrong, either just through the unemployment rate going up or something sort of breaking as a result of a liquidity issue. Uh, so the idea here is to stay invested, but just not chase riskier assets. And that's exactly what we've seen happening over the last couple of weeks here with meme stocks back in the headlines, again, with, with cryptocurrencies hitting all-time highs. So we, again, we would be leaning into higher quality companies here. We were looking, be looking at, at embracing bonds for the income potential that's available there. Once you see things like initial jobless claims picking up, so that's one of the most timely indicators that we're watching mm -hmm. uh, on the labor market, that could be the sign that the cracks in the labor market are getting bigger. We're just not there yet. We're at low 200s. You know, you wake up every Thursday morning and, and the labor market's just fine. Of course, one day you wake up and it won't be. Yeah. Um, and it happens really fast. So we want to be prepared for that now by looking at more defensive areas of markets, looking at higher quality companies, and looking at high quality bonds is really the formula into next year. All right, Emily, uh, great to talk to you. Emily Rowland, co-chief investment strategist over at John Hancock Investment Management, helping us count down to these closing bells. Uh, just about uh, two and a half minutes to go here, Scarlett. Most of the major indices here in the U.S. still holding on to gains on the day and the week. Still holding on to gains, but you look at treasuries and it's a completely different story, right? There's a selling across the curve, particularly at the short end. Uh, the two-year, 4.718%, 12 basis point move there. Yeah, another, and the volatility, too, is also something yeah. to be reckoned with as well. As we move uh, closer uh, to these closing bells, we're going to break down all the cross-asset price action. Our full market coverage right here on Bloomberg starts as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Mike Regan and John Tucker filling in today for Tim Stenevic and Carol Masser. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms as we parse the most crucial moments of the day and, quite frankly, on the week. And we should point out, Mike, six straight weeks now of gains for the S&P 500 unless something really crazy happens in the next minute and a half. Yeah, that's quite a stre uh, stretch of gains, Romain. And really, the leadership of this rally today is pretty interesting. You know, we're not talking about defensive stocks. We're talking about energy, tech, consumer discretionary, commodity stocks. So really those cyclical stocks. So really telling me, Scarlett, that the market is viewing this jobs report as sort of an eco-bullish uh, type of scenario that we will get that soft landing. Uh, at least that's the vibe of the market at the moment. Who knows what next week brings? But uh, we do see oil uh, jumping a little bit after that big plunge in oil we've seen over the last few weeks. So back yeah. above $70 a barrel. We also see risk assets like Bitcoin uh, above $44,000. It had to climb the previous two days, but it's back to its winning streak. Yeah, absolutely. And then you talk about the moves that we saw in the commodity space. At one point, I mean, oil had a huge downdraft uh, over the last couple of days, uh, clawing back some of those losses today up by about 3% here. But again, it adds to this idea here that you do have divergent views of economic conditions. Consumer spending might be holding up, but that industrial activity, at least for right now, globally, not doing so as well. All right, we are getting the closing bells here in New York. So let's start to walk you through the numbers here on the day and on the week. It is green across the screen on the day, and that's going to be just about enough to also give us weekly uh, gains across the board. The Dow Jones Industrial Average higher on the day by about 129 points, or roughly about three to four tenths of a percent here on the day. Meanwhile, the S&P 500 is going to close higher by about 18 points back at that 4,600 level, higher on the day uh, by about four tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq Composite higher by about uh, 64 points or about half a percent here on the day. And let's take a quick look at the Russell 2000. The Russell 2000 is going to finish out with about a seven-tenths uh, of a percent gain on the day. Now, we should point out all of four of those major averages uh, that I just uh, gave you there, higher on the week, though the Dow Jones Industrial Average, only higher by a tenth of a tenth of a percent. So wait for those numbers to settle to see if we can put that one in the history books. And, Romain, there's one mover I've been dying to talk to Scarlett about because I think of Scarlett Fu as sort of our uh, chief gossip co correspondent, <laughs> chief celebrity gossip <laughs> correspondent. Go on. And it's Roblox. Have you seen this yet, Scarlett? I don't know if your sons are on Roblox. It's yes, much to my disappointment. <laughs> it's basically, uh, for, for those who are unfamiliar, you know, it's a video game platform, but there's also a big social media element to it. And the big gain today, 2.5% for Roblox, Scarlett, is being 
because apparently Nicki Minaj has joined the platform, or at least someone pretending to be Nicki Minaj. And it's <laughs> I got like everyone, how you qualified that. Got everyone excited. But, you know, is, Nick, is the Roblox audience Nicki Minaj target uh, customer? I'm not sure. Or target listener? That's a good question. I don't know. You have to ask your sons tonight when you get home. Okay, that'll be a good talking point. <laughs> um, let's just go to the sector performances for a moment here. Put aside Nicki Minaj and take a look at how the 24 industry groups did on this day. You have consumer durable and apparel companies leading the gains. That's really Lululemon. Chip companies also adding more than 1%. And banks bring up the rear in terms of the top three. On the downside, you've got household and personal products losing 9 tenths of 1%. Telecom services and transportation stocks in the red as well. Uh, one of the big gainers on the day. In fact, let's just go ahead and call it. I believe it was the biggest gainer in the S&P 500 was Paramount uh, Global. Those shares higher on the day by about 12 percent here. That was on the back of a report that uh, Skydance and Redbird might be looking to buy the company. Uh, not quite sure where we stand right now, but Felix Gillette over at Bloomberg News says uh, any nego negotiations going on right now would be in the very preliminary stages. But the fact that we now know that it is actually on the block, definitely something to keep an eye on. Dollar General shares, though, moving in the opposite direction here on the day and on the week uh, going to be down about three to four percent on the day and about five percent on a weekly basis but I want you to flip it up here because I thought there was interesting to see how much strength that we saw this day and quite frankly this week in some of the travel names Norwegian Cruise Line shares finished the day lower on the day which is fine because on a weekly basis it did manage to gain 14 percent that matched the gain that it had last week which was about 14 percent as well in fact all of the travel stocks and I mean all of them all of the cruise lines and almost all of the airlines now having phenomenal runs with most of these names, particularly in the airline space, either trading at 52 week highs and in some cases all time highs with one big exception. And that is Alaska Airlines, ALK. Those shares have been under pressure all week long. And that was largely because of the concerns coming out of Monday about its purchase of Hawaiian Airlines. Of course, that deal has a long way to go before it actually gets done. But that 14 percent drop that we saw on Monday, that continued today with another 1 percent drop. And that led to a massive weekly drop uh, for that airline name, the only drop amongst the airlines. Yeah, and maybe there's concern that it overpaid as well. It's a pretty hefty premium to Hawaiian Holdings. I just want to add another decliner there, and it also has to do with M&A. Let's jump ahead to Honeywell, because Honeywell uh, is buying the security unit of Carrier for $4.95 billion. The deal is expected to be immediately accretive to growth, uh, gross margins and operating margins. But as is usually the case with these M&A deals, the acquirer is getting uh, a decline, is seeing a decline, whereas the target is getting a, a, a nice boost. Carrier, of course, getting a, a rise on the day. Um, yeah. Let me just bring up another one that we uh, have been looking at. Restoration Hardware, or RH as it's known now, uh, down 14 percent, biggest decline in three months. You go back to that consumer spending picture yeah. and what it looks like, Romain. Yeah. Um, as much as the airline stocks and the cruise stocks have recovered lately, they had been under pressure for a while, especially yeah. those airline stocks on this idea that people were holding back on spending after uh, a crazy summer in which they just blew out their budgets. Yeah. Yeah. And the RH thing, I mean, we pay so much attention to RH because it almost kind of by default became a barometer, at least for a certain level of spending. And then even to that extent, obviously, the commentary that we would get out of the CEO. But I mean, we know those big ticket items. We've seen a big scale back there. But when, if at all, do we start to see that scale back in other areas? Like I said, take a look at the airline ind index and you're talking about fresh highs there. You take a look at cruise lines, fresh highs there. You even take a look at things like restaurant stocks also doing well, not quite at highs, but certainly showing a lot of strength. All right, let's uh, take a look at what's going on uh, in the yield space, too, uh, because, of course, that has been the flip-flop from day to day as we go back from rally uh, to sell-off. And today here, it was pretty much a sell-off across the board here, pushing yields higher, particularly on the shorter end of the curve, 12 basis points higher on the two-year, 11 basis points on the five-year. Uh, smaller moves on the longer end of the curve, but overall a shift higher on the yield. Yeah, maybe we're back to that scenario where good news is actually good news at this point. And did anybody notice the S&P 500 for the year just shy of the 20% mark? It's worth also noting that the NASDAQ year-to-date 37% higher. Yeah, Take that. That's right. And that uh, you know, is a new uh, high for the year for the S&P 500. And in fact, the highest since March of 2022. So uh, if you round up, it's almost a two-year high soon. But I can't uh, sort of get past the idea of uh, how this is an unusual day in the market since we do have this spike higher in yields, the dollar's higher, oil's higher. 
and equities are all higher together. So, uh, Scar, that's a lot of sort of conflicting signals for the yeah. market here. I, I can't help but wonder if that Santa Claus rally might be starting a little early uh, and uh, equity investors are really not paying attention to the other signals in the market and just trying to dress those windows for the year-end letters that fund managers have to sell to them. Have you talked to Santa Claus about this rally? <laughs> I've been a bad boy. He won't, he won't answer Ask him call. why correlations are, are breaking down. I'm, I'm sure that'll be the first thing he wants to answer. <laughs> yeah, he, he loves that when you corner him, when he comes down the chimney, he's eating those cookies, and you start asking him about the dot plot. <laughs> and he just stares blankly at you and is like, dude, I just deliver toys. <laughs> I'm a delivery service. Um, one thing that we should mention, since you brought up yields earlier, Romain, is we do have Treasury auctions next week. And it's going to be a lot in supply, $108 billion, in addition to the FOMC meeting sandwiched in between two big sales. So that's going to put some pressure on yields as well to, to move them higher, at least keep them at these elevated levels. What can he say? What can Jay Powell say, Mike Regan, next week that is going to change anybody's mind? I mean, we know he's not going to, you know, come out and definitively say we're done hiking rates or we're, you know, ready for rate cuts or anything else. So I kind of wonder what's left. I mean, the data speaks for itself. Well, and speaking of data, there is one more potential curveball to come for Jay Powell next week, and that is uh, the actual CPI report expected on the 12th. Uh, economists looking for a little bit of a pickup month over month from 0.2% to 0.3%. But on a year over year basis, they do expect it to come back down from 3.2% to 3.1%. So still a little hot, Romaine, but moving in the right direction if these economists' estimates are correct. All right, uh, Mike, we will talk to you on Monday. John, we'll talk to you as well. Can you actually start practicing on what you're going to draw for us uh, next week. I thought here. that was a pretty good rendering. It, it was actually, I mean, it, was, it, was, it was better than I think what most people can do. That's the best Taylor uh, so Swift drawing. You've you got a second career there. You'll see them at Christie's or Sotheby's uh, sometime in the future as we wrap up our cross-platform coverage of the market close on Bloomberg Television Radio and YouTube. And a reminder, Bloomberg Business Week is now on Bloomberg Originals. We'll be back tomorrow at the same, uh, we'll be back on Monday at the same time and the same place. All right, coming up here. Coming up here on Bloomberg Television, we continue our discussion here about economic conditions, about investments, and about the latest on endowments and foundations. We're going to discuss that with the Mercer and their market outlook heading into 2024. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right. Well, the big rally that we saw last week in Treasuries, that got pulled back just a little bit here this week. You take a look at the two-year yield, the shorter end of the curve. On a weekly basis, we're up about 18 basis points. Now, of course, that did not call back all uh, of that drop in yields that we saw last week. But it does show you really kind of the ping-pong effect here as investors really try to parse that economic data and, more importantly, try to parse how the Fed is going to react to that data. A Fed that begins its two-day meeting on Tuesday, a Fed that has made it clear it has no intention of cutting rates any time soon. The S&P 500, though, is taking a little bit of solace in that economic data and that even if there isn't rate cuts, multiple rate cuts, this is enough uh, evidence in the data to maybe potentially keep the Fed on hold forever, or at least until they get to their next cycle here. The risk appetite was reflected in the big jump bump up that we saw in Bitcoin and some of the other crypto assets. 14% gain on Bitcoin on the week. Ethereum also up by about 10% on the week as well. But then we had that big drop in commodities, particularly when it comes uh, into the energy space. As a group, they were down about 4% here. But it was particularly some of the softness you saw in the industrial uh, commodities, uh, like copper, as well as in some of the energy space when it comes to uh, uh, crude oil. And that is raising the question here about economic activity globally and whether it is actually as healthy as some people would like it to be. But that brings us back to the U.S. and the labor market report that we got this morning, and more importantly, a wage report that we got this morning. Wages still holding strong, up about 0.4 percent on a month-to-month -month basis, up 4 percent on a year-to-year -year basis. And whether that's going to cause Jay Powell and company some concern as they head into that meeting next week remains to be seen. But what we do know is that the trend line, at least on average hourly earnings, is not right now to the downside. For now, right? And that's always the key point. All right, as the world prepares to usher in a new year, Mercer is out with its latest report that looks back and reflects on how firms invested for endowments and foundations. And of those surveyed, inflation and recession risk were two of the top 
economic concerns. So I'm pleased to say here in studio with us, with more, is Alalu Aganga. She is U.S. Chief Investment Officer at Mercer. Uh, Alalu, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, both of you. So when you talk about endowments and foundations, they clearly have very long time horizons. And then I look at what's happened in just the last three months alone, or never mind the last three months, last two months, and you look at the 10-year yield, 5% in late October, 4.1% uh, yesterday. How concerning is that kind of volatility for endowments and foundations, which again, long time horizon, but the volatility has got to get their attention. The time horizon really matters. Um, and the immediate reaction when you have volatility spikes is it tends to decrease the risk appetite. Um, but clients in this spectrum, as you mentioned, long horizon type investors, what they do is they buckle down, you really look and assess what type of risks you're holding, um, and there's a lot of monitoring that happens, but no real reaction immediately. We, we actually counsel clients against doing that mm -hmm. um, because it tends to dissipate. So a lot of monitoring happening. Um, how how often are the, the portfolio adjusted or tweaked when it comes down to it? So for this survey, you'll see we had about 115 respondents from 24 countries, seven regions. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to look at some of the trends and the takeaways, one of the bigger trends actually that we saw was a move towards private markets, mm -hmm. so more e-liquid investments. Mm -hmm. Almost 70% of respondents said that this was the area that they'd increased the most in the last three years. So with regards to that, the public markets portfolio is like it's there and it's the grounding, but there's a lot more focus within alternatives. Well, has that focus in, or that push into alternatives, has that created any liquidity issues at all? Well, so in this, inv in this inflationary environment, uh, some of the other takeaways that we've seen, frankly, is higher spending. Mm -hmm. So higher spending rates, they have had to have um, a little bit more liquidity in order to be able to meet that, but mm -hmm. it just meant portfolio adjustments. So higher spending, but then there are opportunities in fixed income, so re yeah. repurposing and reallocating their uh, portfolios to take advantage of that. Well, anytime you talk, and we should point out, uh, with a lot of these endowments, yeah. uh, obviously they're kind of the longest of long-term investors, Correct. and, and they don't necessarily have to care as much about some of the incremental yeah. moves, but there is a lot going on out there that could have longer-term effects. We've been talking a lot on this show yeah. about some of the political issues, particularly surrounding Israel and free speech on campuses and anti-Semitism, and we've had some high-profile uh, donors uh, at UPenn and uh, MIT, Harvard, basically say they're pulling money, and, and significant money. Yeah. And I'm wondering, when does that become a concern? It's one thing when a donor who maybe gives you a uh, million dollars a year pulls back, but when somebody who gives you a $100 million gift says, I want it back, that has to have some sort of implication for how you structure going forward. It really does. And geopolitics yeah. is one of the, the yeah. areas in the survey that these clients have said that it's, mm -hmm. it's concern because geopolitics has a ripple effect. So it's everything mm -hmm. from uh, supply chain disruptions, possible sanctions, reputational risk, um, as you've just mm -hmm. highlighted. So when those things occur, it really causes these clients to look closely at their holdings and mm -hmm. evaluate whether some of these I, areas is where they should be longer term. I, I'm, but I am curious about that. Have you heard from them? Because I mean, I feel like the, the folks running these, are down, they're almost completely outside the purview yeah. of this. I mean, it's kind of like they have no control. It's basically whatever the presidents and the other teachers and faculty are doing and saying here. So they just kind of have to sit by and what, do nothing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. there's a push and yeah. pull with regards to, yeah. to endowments at the end yeah. of the day. As chief investment officers, you're focused on the portfolios, yeah. and then there are a lot of extraneous factors that you can't control, yeah. unfortunately. Gotcha. One thing that they may come under pressure to do is, of course, um, divest. Divest from certain regions or divest from certain kinds of companies that do business uh, in Israel or in the Middle East. How do endowments and foundations respond to that? What, what's the decision-making process like that in, in terms of what that means for their overall portfolio? So every foundation and endowment is really unique. They have to make the decision about whether they're going to put values um, or things like that within their portfolio. Some choose to and some don't. So the divestment or not divesting situation um, tends to be organization-specific. Some That's choose to don't. engage. Not really, no. So it, um, it, you take it as it comes. So you take it as it comes. You really work with them to be able to understand their values, their organizational uh, position, and see if it's something that should be included, but not, you know, divesting. These are big decisions that right. have to be made. Yeah, no, absolutely. What have you seen when it comes to um, ESG uh, and that kind of mandate? Because there's been a backlash against all of it, and we've seen that ESG funds and ESG 
type investments haven't actually performed the way that people had anticipated they would. So in the survey, it's global. We've actually seen a really big focus and attention uh, with ESG with regards to Euro European funds, UK, yes. Australia, in the US not so much. So it's more a bifurcation of the data based on geography. So US has been a little bit behind, but some of the other areas are really leaning into it. And you're also finding that playing out in public markets and the investments they're holding, uh, sorry, private markets and the investments they're holding. And just real quickly, we only have about a minute left yeah. here. I, I, I kind of want to push this forward too, because the other hot button topic has been ESG. Yeah. And, and whether you should be involved in that or at least the structure of that here. Uh, how are you finding uh, the survey respondents dealing with some of those pressures now? Very, very mixed. Yeah. So firstly, differential in geography. Mm -hmm. And then second, it's how you implement it. So mm -hmm. is it climate transition? What areas of, of ESG are you going to focus on? It was just um, very, very dispersed, but again, concentrated more, at least from a focus standpoint, internationally. Mm -hmm. All right, Alalo, always a great uh, conversation and great data uh, and insights uh, coming out of the folks over at Mercer. Uh, she's the U.S. Chief Investment Officer there at uh, Mercer. Uh, stick with us here on The Big Show. We're going to dive deeper into economic conditions and the state of the labor market here in the U.S. with Haley Dam over at Adedeco. She's on deck. This is Bloomberg. Focus today on the health of the U.S. labor market after that hotter than expected payrolls number for November. A jump in consumer sentiment came in a different report, and it has Wall Street now rethinking the outlook for interest rates. Market now pricing higher rates for longer. Joining us right now is Haley Dam, vice president over at ADECO, uh, to talk a little bit more about, I guess, the trend here, Haley. And let's just be clear, one report does not make a trend, but you've seen the previous reports here. Are we seeing a stronger labor market or a softer one? Overall, a really great report today on the numbers. So we've continued to, over the past few months, see a lot of resiliency and stability in those uh, labor numbers. And it's very much aligned with what we expected and also what we're seeing in the market. So this gets to this idea then, if the market is improving or labor, or at least let's not use the word improve, let's just say the market is healthy and it's going to stay healthy here. Does that complicate the inflation picture, which seemed to hinge on this idea of having some moderation in labor market growth and, more importantly, some moderation in wages? Well, what I'll tell you is I'm certainly not an economist, but what it's offering employers the ability to do is take a unique turn in the conversation and focus really more on the stability of their individual workforce and how you retain that talent and attract talent from a very, very tight labor pool. So let's talk about some of those offerings that employers do give to make sure that they can keep their most valued employees. Uh, we were just talking about how Indeed uh, is a company that is pulling back and rescinding its mental health days that it once used to give out to employees because uh, employees are now able to take time off. They don't need to get those extra days off. Also, I think partly as a way to reduce costs and expenses. And this is something that's not limited to, of course, Indeed. To what extent are employers, do they have the upper hand once again right now? Well, what I'll say is we used to be talking about flexibility, but the conversation has truly turned to stability. So job seekers are a little choosier about the organizations that they're looking to work for, and movement within the market has certainly decreased. So they're truly looking for things like accessibility to really nice benefits, work environment, career pathing, and the ability to increase and enhance their skills in the workplace that they're in today. What about remote work and hybrid work? Is that still on offer in the same way it was a year ago, or are employees, potential employees, having to give up salary in order to get that kind of flexibility? It's certainly a mixed bag. There's still a lot of opportunities for remote work, and then we've seen a lot of employers also turn to um, more of an in-office uh, environment. Both are good, and I think there's workers available to suit both environments. Uh, so to so suit both environments, I am curious, though, too, this idea of the labor market that we've seen, obviously, we know that it's shifting. It may still be healthy, but there are obviously some dynamics to that are shifting. There were a few things that jumped out at me. It wasn't necessarily in this report, but in some other data we have. 
the seasonal hiring did not, does not, at least from what I can tell, does not seem to be at the same levels that we had uh, the prior uh, Christmas holiday season. On top of that, some of the other jobs that also have seasonality, particularly in the spring and summer, I'm curious as to whether we see a shift in that demand as we get into uh, 2024. Uh, what I can say about the most recent seasonal hiring season for us is that we did see the trend of more condensed hiring. So it was shorter term on the onboarding of those associates. However, the need to keep them longer is very interesting. We're seeing assignments last through the end of December and into January and February, um, which we have not seen in the past. Hmm, that's interesting. Do they have the same, do uh, the workers, uh, do they have the same sort of bargaining power when it comes to their wages? Seasonality is a very, very powerful force. So yes, wage pressure during that time, of course, is important. It's really the employers going out and wanting to seek out the best talent to meet their demand in that time. And it's a very competitive environment, specifically um, in a seasonal space. Uh, but yeah, wage pressure is always going to be a thing. We have seen it slow slightly, um, but that's exactly where we want to see the focus shift more to retention and the benefits that employees can get in those environments. So just looking ahead, um, for the graduating class of 2024, of course, many of them are looking for jobs right now. They're sending in their resumes. They're trying to get interviews. There's so much that is uncertain, but what has remained uh, pretty s stable up until now is that the job market is holding up and the consumer is fairly resilient. How are you seeing that translate into job offers for this newest entrant of employees? The resiliency is a very important thing to note. Um, what I would say to that population is look for something that you feel passionate about and that you see a trajectory in. Um, it's not always exactly maybe what you studied or what you think that you're going to do, but there's a lot of opportunities out there for people who are willing to learn and ingrain themselves in an organization in a meaningful way. All right, ADECO Vice President Haley Dam, thank you so much for joining us on this Jobs Day uh, where we had a better than expected jobs report. Um, Romaine, it raises a lot of questions about how things look in 2024. If there is softness in the labor market, everyone says that, yeah. it's just we're performing better than we thought we would be at this point. Yeah. When the music stops playing, what happens? Well, I think that's a good point. I mean, it's not so much that everything is all copacetic. It's just that it's not as bad as mm -hmm. what people thought, or it's better, I, let's just say, than what people thought here. But how quickly can that change? And we've had a, a lot of great uh, uh, reporting on the Bloomberg Terminal that has showed historically how fast yep. that labor market switch can flip. Exactly. And these data yeah. uh, points, especially on the labor market, tend to be backwards looking. So by yeah. the time it's confirmed in the data, it's already happening in the real world. Absolutely. All right. Still ahead, it is our next up segment. We'll speak with the CEO of the startup Cav, which makes custom fitted bicycle helmets. I don't see anyone wearing bicycle helmets on the streets of New York City, do you? Uh, uh, yeah, I do, the smart do people. Well, I don't know, there's far too many people weaving in and out of traffic without helmets on. Yes, we it makes me curious, all right. We have a word for those <laughs> That's next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. How did U.S. markets do this week? They did well, and just well. Fractional gains on the day, fractional gains on the week, but for the S&P 500, that adds up to six straight weeks of gains. For the Russell 2000, it's four straight weeks of gains. That is a rally, and at least for right now, it is being sustained, despite some of the volatility that we saw in the Treasury space and despite some of the depression that we saw in the commodity space. Equities have found a way to rally on and, more importantly, to broaden out that rally beyond the Magnificent Seven to a whole new cohort of stocks, Scarlett, that are much more cyclical and, quite frankly, much more tied to economic optimism. Yeah, we'll see if that lasts, of course, when we get the CPI data next week and the Fed decision as well on Wednesday. Meanwhile, let's take a look at what's going on in the space of retail because Amazon is suing what it calls an international ring of thieves who allegedly stole millions of dollars in merchandise from the company through a series of refund scams. Bloomberg's Spencer Soper reported on this and joins us now. So, Spencer, first of all, tell us what this scam was. How did it work? Yes, so there's a, a group of ringleaders uh, that I don't think have been identified yet, but they'll basically advertise this uh, in in wide open, like on sites like Reddit and Discord, and say, hey, do you want to get some expensive stuff for cheap? And if you're willing to, to you know, get involved in the scam, basically, 
you're going to give them a small percentage of what it costs, like maybe a few hundred dollars for a two thousand dollar laptop. Uh, they're going to help you buy it. Then you're going to send it back and request a refund. Um, I'm sorry, you're going to you're going to buy it and get a refund without returning the item. Yeah. So basically, like getting free merchandise. But, uh, uh, and Amazon says they've lost like millions of dollars in merchandise as a result of this thing. It also involved bribing um, Amazon employees to authorize these refunds, even though the the products hadn't been returned. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was it was pretty massive in terms of scope. We're talking people all over the world well, doing this, so it's uh, it's a big scam. Well, well, that's what I'm curious about is just really the scale of it. I think anyone who's, tr- who's had to return something to Amazon has always kind of scratched their head as to why they don't ask more questions. But you know, it's one thing to sort of uh, you know defraud Amazon of a few hundred bucks, but when you're talking about tens and tens of millions of dollars here, why did this take so long for Amazon a to find out about it, and more importantly to clamp down on it? Yeah, well, it, that's a great question. And part of it, one, the, the scope of it is because people are actually making money by perpetuating this. It's not just like one person trying to you know, pull a fast one. It's actually become a, a business uh, to orchestrate it. And then, you know, Amazon has, you know, it's, it's I think this year it's going to be like six or seven hundred billion dollars spent on the site. So, you know, these are like these are big numbers in terms of millions of dollars of merchandise, but there's still rounding errors for Amazon. So that kind of stuff can fly below the radar. And especially when you bring in um, insiders helping you, you know, because they have some authorization to override a machine. A lot of these refunds are triggered by packaging receipts and making sure that the right stuff is happening. And and employees can override that. So they got the help from folks on the inside to override it and had to hit a, a certain scale before they figured out that something fishy was going on. All right, uh, Spencer, always uh, great to talk to you. Uh, Spencer Soper and a really interesting story involving Amazon and uh, a a pretty uh, organized uh, theft ring here that I guess they're trying to get under control. All right, we want to pivot from that to our next up segment, where we highlight the entrepreneurs and small businesses that could be the next big thing. These folks and the venture capitalists that fund them, they're the ones moving the needle in the markets, technology, and the economy. There's a report from Streetlight Data that finds significant gains in cycling, bicycling across the U.S. since the start of the pandemic. In the New York City metro area, that actually tops the list with an increase of about 97 percent. The report says the gains are largely driven by improvements in infrastructure for cycling and weather. Now, one startup that stands to benefit from that increase in cycling is called CAB. It makes custom-sized helmets for its customers using a pretty unique technology. And I'm pleased to say that the founder and CEO of that company, Whitman Kwok, is joining us right now here on our next up segment. All right, Whitman, uh, when I first saw, you gave a presentation a few months ago uh, as you were trying to raise some money. uh, And it was interesting to see bicycle helmets in amidst all these other pitches, which are all about some newfangled technology. But there's a lot of technology that goes into this. These are basically custom molded helmets and you're going after a very distinct market. Yeah, that's right. Our initial market is, is cycling, though the technology we've built out is actually general purpose and allows us to serve anywhere where mass customization would be beneficial, which is uh, quite quite a large market. But yeah, we, we chose cycling initially. Um, it's, it's near and dear to my heart um, as a cyclist. And as you say, uh, the general trends, it's, it's a ubiquitous activity, uh, clean transportation, a great way to get outside, a great way to spend time um, with, with people. And for that reason, uh, it, it was our first real uh, target market, uh, starting with the technology. And as you mentioned, Um, There's a lot of tech in there. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, first, let's start off with the customer base. You yourself are a competitive cyclist, as we can see from all uh, the bibs and awards behind you here. (laughs) And you are largely pitching this, the helmet itself, uh, to folks like you. And I'm wondering here whether you need to or want to actually broaden that out beyond kind of the hardcore dedicated cyclists. Yeah, I think that's actually uh, a common misconception that uh, just because this is a high-tech product, it's only serving the premium market. Uh, and, and I think, in fact, we're serving anyone who uh, just enjoys the sport. And so uh, many of the customers we have, I would characterize them as cyclist enth- enthusiasts, right? They're folks who maybe commute to work um, once a week or are weekend warriors who just want to get out and um, ride with their kids or family um, or with their with their local club. So although... Uh, we obviously showcase a lot of the, the racers um, and pros that, that use our helmets. Uh, this is a, a mass market product, and that's always been our intent uh, as part of our mission to save lives and reduce head trauma. Uh, to do so, we want to serve as broad of a market as possible. 
again, initially in cycling, but serving other markets uh, eventually as well. Yeah, initially in cycling, and I'm sure your customers are pretty active too. They're not just cycling, but they're doing other things as well. Maybe they're skiing, maybe they're snowboarding, maybe they're also rollerblading. Are these helmets, and, and forgive me for asking a, a basic question, are helmets, can they be interchangeable between different sports or do they need to be something specific for uh, street racing, for instance? Yeah, no, it's a uh, it's a good question, Scarlett, because I, I think uh, not many people, obviously, other than uh, myself, who spend so much time in the industry, but um, generally by activity, there are different like certification requirements. I think what is fantastic about the technology is one, um, the platform itself can make helmets in different markets, um, but also that the uh, safety protection technologies that we've employed are our hex matrix and the materials that we use are general purpose materials that far exceed the standards and therefore uh, are very applicable for as you say snow sports or skateboarding um, or even things like uh, construction for example mm. so uh, we're really excited not just about where we're at currently but um, all the opportunities to again accelerate our mission saving lives and, and really getting people excited about the helmets i think one of the feedbacks we get was that uh, the helmets make people look great, feel great. And um, I couldn't help but overhear you know, the comment, I think earlier before the break about you know, that a lot of cyclists in New York aren't wearing helmets. And I think for <laughs> us, that's, that's a huge opportunity as well, right? That the people yeah. who uh, have held off because they can't find something comfortable or something that looks good on them. That actually, that's where I wanna go next because my producer just kind of spoke up and said, yeah, I'm one of the people who ride a city bike on the streets and I don't wear a helmet. People don't like wearing helmets. I mean, that's helmets, that's part of it. How do you tackle that as someone who, whose livelihood depends on, on constructing these tailored, uh, high fit, well fit helmets? It, it feels like it's a marketing question more than a, an engineering question. Yeah, it, it's a little bit of both. Uh, I, I'd say like we engineer it for the market, right? Because at the end of the day, what we're doing is creating a product that creates a phenomenal user experience that people will want to naturally wear the helmet. And so, um, unfortunately, we, we had a, a rash of like three customers getting accidents, um, but actually hit by cars uh, this, this last week. Um, but one of them wrote a very detailed response and he said like, look, um, you saved my life. Um, the, the technology worked as employed, but not only that, the helmet was so comfortable um, that when my wife had bought it for me, like I, I wanted to wear it. And you literally saved my life because I, I wouldn't have otherwise you know, have, have worn a helmet. Um, and we have similar reports of people just saying, hey, the helmet looks great. Um, we've won three awards, including Time Magazine's Invention of the Year. Yeah. And, and it's really kudos to the team that we have here that they're designing, again, not just the safety aspects, but for what people want to yeah. see and feel um, while, right. while they're riding a bike. And we should point and, and to frankly make it cool, right, to wear a helmet. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. I mean, the, the helmet, and we should point out, the helmet is very streamlined. I mean, we were showing pictures of it. Definitely stylish than some of those bulkier helmets that you would get. Uh, I do want to ask you a little bit about your selling process. You are still direct to consumer, correct? Do you have any that, plans? That is correct. Do you have any plans to to try to go into third party retail or even your own retail, uh, brick and mortar retail? Yeah. So we're fortunate. We have um, our current base in Silicon Valley, and we do have cycling clubs and uh, people who come in to get fitted or to check out the product there. Um, I think that uh, there's always going to be a group of people who just like to see, touch and feel product before purchasing. So our, our long-term solution is to be kind of a hybrid model uh, mm -hmm. or omni-channel. Uh, but what we found is that we're so early in the process with this technology that there's, there's a huge market of early adopters that are more than willing to engage with us um, solely online. But I think you'll start seeing us um, as early as next year, um, kind of expanding our, our physical footprint. Um, we get lots of inquiries um, from uh, local bike stores, as well as some of the bigger players in the industry asking if we can do co collabs with them mm -hmm. um, and uh, take advantage of, of having our helmets in their physical locations, yeah. um, as well as giving them something exciting to talk about to amplify their brands. Are, you're making these in the United States, correct? That's correct. It's really important to us to kind of support local manufacturing. Um, I think that's one of the, the flip sides of the benefit of our technology stack is that it makes it very economical and practical um, to support manufacturing in the U.S. And, and I think it's an opportunity for us to reinvigorate the industrial base. Um, and I think that's become more important uh, for, for our country in the last, last few years. All right, Whitman. Well, it was great to talk to you, and we should check in on you uh, in uh, due time uh, to see how things are going. Whitman Kwok there. He's the founder and CEO of Bicycle Helmet Company, uh, Cav.
All right, coming up uh, after the break, we're going to hear from Larry Summers, a former U.S. Treasury Secretary, get his take here on the jobs numbers that we got this morning. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week Daily, right here on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week Daily segment with the host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, who joins us every day. And you got a big show coming up in about an hour. But you already had a chance to sit down with the yep. former Treasury Secretary, Larry Summers. And he had some thoughts here on the state of the economy. Yeah, exactly. Given those jobs yeah. numbers we got this morning, which surprised some people mm -hmm. how strong they were. So we started out asking Larry Summers, who, after all, was the former Treasury Secretary. We started asking, what does those numbers tell us about this economy? They showed an economy that at least uh, as of November, was still looking uh, pretty robust. Some of the greatest fears that the economy was turning over certainly looked to have been falsified uh, by this uh, number. The fact that average hourly earnings were running above, running at four-tenths of a percent, a bit more than was expected, reinforces my sense that people need to be careful about declaring the war against inflation as having been won. They need to be nervous about uh, what could happen from supply shocks, from other adverse developments. But I read these as a pretty favorable uh, number. They certainly make a soft landing look more in play, although I certainly think it would be a mistake uh, to treat a soft landing as something we can take for granted or be confident about. What do they say to the Fed, do you think, Larry? Because on the one hand, you say, boy, this is a pretty robust labor economy. We don't need to cut uh, too soon. And people were expecting some cuts. And as you say, on inflation, there are some indications inflation is ticking back up. We have an Atlanta Fed that says that. And they had the UMICH uh, consumer uh, in, in, uh, sentiment this week indicated that it really dropped the consumer expectations that for inflation for one year out. Look, I think the Fed's got to be very careful. Uh, progress has been made about against inflation, but they've got to make sure that it keeps being made, and they've got to make sure that once it's made, it's entrenched and locked in. And I think this will make it easier uh, for them uh, to do that. They've got a very tricky problem uh, at uh, the Fed because whenever people conclude that uh, it's looking good, that we're not going to need more rate increases, um, they long rates come way down and the stock market has a tendency to go up and that then undoes some of the tightening that they have already put in place. So I think it's very hard to know what's going to happen. I still think the market is a bit overpricing how much easing the Fed's going to decide it can prudently undertake. But those issues are very much at the margin, unlike the situation we had a couple of years ago, where it seemed to me the Fed was very far very far off. So I think the Fed's in broadly the right place of watchful uh, waiting. But the moment they turn or announce they're going to turn is going to be a seismic moment. And for that reason, they probably need to be very deliberative and careful about getting to that point and waiting until they see some overwhelming evidence of inflation being locked in low or see some real evidence of the economy turning over. And I don't think we have either of those at this point. 
Uh, Larry, let's turn to something that's very much in the news once again this week, and you have spoken out about it, and that is the rise of anti-Semitism, at least on some college campuses. We had the three university presidents go down and appear in Congress from your own Harvard, as well as MIT and Penn. And if they meant to put an end to this, uh, they certainly did not succeed as of right now. It looks like if anything got to be more so. But this is one of my questions. You, you ran Harvard. You were a president there. But you also were at very senior levels in the, in the government. When things start to go off the rails, when you start to lose control of the narrative, how do you get it back? Because we have everybody now wanting to run universities for the college presidents, whether it's Congress or whether they're contributors or whatever. How do you regain control of the narrative? I think this is as difficult a moment for elite higher education as any moment since the Vietnam War period, perhaps uh, more difficult. I think everybody needs to take a bit of a deep breath. I've had considerable sympathy with uh, some of the things that have been saying, said by both uh, people in the government and uh, by some of the billionaires, some of the donors uh, to these universities. But even when the concerns are warranted, it's very important for us to remember that if universities start being run by politicians or by small groups of large donors, that's going to be a very problematic thing over time uh, for the American university system, which is a huge source of strength uh, for our country. That said, David, um, we have to recognize that there's been a double standard in how incidents of racism have been regarded in the past, incidents of what people call microaggressions, uh, incidents of things that make people feel hurt or uh, sensitive have been regarded in the past, and the way things that are abhorrent to the sensibilities of so many of us have uh, been regarded in the last several months. And that double standard, which in different ways has been present on many campuses, creates an extremely difficult situation. That was Larry Summers, our special contributor on Wall Street Weekend. I must say, he goes on and says it's not just the college presidents, it's also the trustees. He says, where's the board yeah. and all this? They have fiduciary obligations. They need to step up. Yeah, and now it's become an issue also for, of course, a lot of the heads of these endowments. I and mean, we just yeah. had the U.S. Chief Investment Officer from Mercer uh, on the close, and she was talking about the challenges that they're facing now, particularly when you have a donor comes and says, look, you know, the $100, billion, $100 million that we pledged, we want it back. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. And, and listen, realistically, somebody yeah. gives you $100 million, they're going to expect something. They're yes. going to expect at least you to listen to them, listen you know, them. when you have oh, some complaints. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah, big time. You know, so it's a, it's a problem. But yeah. I say one of the problems is once it really goes sideways, mm -hmm. it's hard to get it back. Yeah, absolutely. At this point, it's hard to see how they're going to do and it. And I think his point is good about kind of who's in control right now. Yeah. You know, it, you can't necessarily have it run by the donors. Like, you know, <laughs> exactly. We know they kind of run most universities. Yeah. But at the same time, the college presidents need to figure out a way yeah. to uh, get this ship back uh, on, on keel. So in addition to Larry, we're also going to have Vimal Kapoor. He's the mm -hmm. CEO, as you know, of Honeywell, it's a company mm -hmm. you've covered, Romaine. They had their big announcement of the carrier acquisition today. We'll have Aaron Brown from PIMCO about what's going on in the markets. And we'll hear from Bob Diamond, former head of Barclays, about those te that testimony by the bank CEOs this week up on Capitol Hill. That's on Wall Street Week coming up at 6 p.m. New York time. All right, another great lineup as David Weston wraps up the week. But stick around. Here on The Close, we're going to set you up for what to watch in the week ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, wrapping up another volatile week, yeah. I guess, if you will. It all sort of worked out for most of the investors, at least in the equity space. Let's take a look uh, at what's going on next week that everyone's going to be focused on. And we start off on Monday and Tuesday with two big Treasury auctions. Right, and this might be something that continues to put pressure on yields. We've got $108 billion worth of supply coming to mm -hmm. market. And, of course, the FOMC meeting right after that. So 
there might be some positioning going on. Yields have already elevated today because mm -hmm. of the jobs report. A lot of people will be paying attention to those two auctions, 10-year on Monday, 30-year on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. But also on Tuesday, we're going to get another read on inflation. Right, and this is the last data point before the FOMC decision. Right now, we're looking at a three-handle for the headline number, year-over-year, 3.1% -year, uh, increase. That is a slowdown from the prior month. But on a month-over-month -month basis, little change here. Of course, when you strip out food and energy, that's a 0.3% increase. Another data point that Jay Powell and company are going to have to put on the table mm -hmm. when they begin that two-day meeting on Tuesday morning, a big rate decision on Wednesday. And we'll be all over that coverage, starting with team surveillance and following through with us. And of course, uh, we'll be breaking down the numbers. And the statement of economic projections comes out, too. Absolutely. Not hot. Yeah, and it's not the only central bank in play. The European Central Bank and uh, who else? Bank, bank of, of England, England. Yep. and the Swiss uh, National Bank also scheduled to have rate decisions as well. And believe it or not, Scarlett, earnings season, it never ends. We, we, we say this <laughs> yeah. all the time. We continually yeah. surprise ourselves. Costco is going to come out, which will be fascinating because Okay. There's a good read on the consumer, especially yeah. as everyone tries to be value-minded. All right, Lennar, Adobe, Johnson Controls, just a few others here that we will be covering in full. So please join us next week right here on The Close. We always appreciate you watching. Have a wonderful weekend. This is Bloomberg.